Write down a little bit. Shh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Patrick Rafter, and it's my pleasure to introduce the session alongside my good friends, Jamie Palter and Tim DeVries. Uh, but we also want to acknowledge our um, fellow organizers, Rue Nich Nicholson, Nicola Wiseman, and did I forget anyone else? Uh, Matt Long. No, wait, that's a. Um, <laughs> we have everybody. Oh, I wanted to uh, thank Heather and May, of course, for all your help. Um, now, our session, Quantifying Marine CDR Efficacy and Uncertainty. So CDR standing for carbon dioxide removal and sort of keeping with the theme of the event. This morning, I uh, looked up some AI or I made some AI images. This was um, in response to Jamie's recommendation that we have a pretty ocean picture in our title slide. So I put pretty ocean carbon dioxide removal. And this is one, this is the least, the least scary of the images. So, um, okay, so our motivation, right? Um, atmospheric CO2 is too damn high. All right, so we're gonna work on that. So this is a plot uh, from the Global, Global Carbon Project, uh, gig, um, gigatons of carbon on the y-axis, time moving forward to the right, and where are we? Um, we're up at this high end here, right? And so um, for us to keep global warming to 1.5 degrees C uh, or below, we're going to both have to uh, drastically, radically limit uh, emissions, drop emissions down to zero, and we need as well as carbon dioxide removal, okay? So um, this is our motivation for our talk. And, um, and why we are here today talking about this. So uh, very quickly, this was to, uh, uh, to help our speakers today, just give a quick background on some of the CDR strategies, the marine CDR strategies. Um, we can break them down kind of roughly into uh, two flavors. The first is biological, all right? And so that would be uh, these guys here. This is you know stimulating carbon fixation in the upper ocean. Um, and uh, allowing some of that uh, to sink to some depths where we're going to sequester that carbon away for a little bit. The next flavor is chemical. And so we can think of this as uh, both uh, a strategy involving direct ocean removal and uh, alkalinity enhancement. All right, so pretty, uh, that's about our, our background slides um, because we want to get to the good stuff eventually, and, but we're still in the intro, here we go. Thanks, Patrick. And so we wanted to define a few terms so that uh, all of the subsequent speakers wouldn't have to do it repeatedly. And so those have to do with um, safety, additionality, and durability. So safety um, of a mechanism, of a CDR strategy, a marine carbon dioxide removal strategy, would be to demonstrate the absence of ecosystem or other types of harms uh, that are likely to result from that strategy. And um, these should be compared not against no action, we would argue, but against no, uh, the, the carbon remaining in the atmosphere, which also is not a neutral decision, right, to, to leave that carbon in the atmosphere. Um, if, these, if, if a CDR solution or strategy is found to be unsafe, that could be a gating criteria to not go further and assess its efficacy and durability, because if it's not safe, we, we wouldn't go further with that. Um, and so the additionality is the idea that the carbon dioxide uptake is in excess of an unperturbed counterfactual. And so I think even just using that word counterfactual, um, which means like the baseline or some hypothetical unperturbed ocean, um, unperturbed by the CDR solution or strategy, um, is really hard to know in the ocean. And so that points to how hard it is to know additionality. You don't only have to assess how much more carbon got into the ocean, but relative to a baseline, which itself is hard to assess. As we all know, that's like the bread and butter of this group. Um, and then durability. Uh, people have used the word permanent as a metric to describe how long uh, carbon, dioxide, carbon is removed from the ocean atmosphere like exchange system. But um, we prefer the term durability because nothing is truly permanent. Um, and so we can think about how long um, carbon stays uh, durably removed from the atmosphere, um, and or it's kind of the time scale associated with a leakage rate. It's another way to think of it. Okay. Um, 
just a tiny bit of the history of the OCB um, community's involvement in this and, and why we need the OCB community. Oh, that's right. It says it here, why we need the OCB community. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to do it then. As Heather said, if, we, if the people in this room don't step up to the plate um, and, and try to uh, figure out if this works and how it might work and um, how to make it work, who will, right? Um, who better to tackle green CDR questions than the OCB community? Heather mm -hmm. Benway. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so we've, this isn't the first time OCB has tried to um, address this. Uh, we had a workshop at the University of Rhode Island uh, last September, um, and there's an EOS article um, coming out of that that basically it was meant to be a call to action of this community that says, if we don't act now, um, inadequate protocols could become the default. Uh, and in, uh, solutions that are very promising could fail to launch because they don't have value if we don't know that they work. Or we could prolong investment in strategies that are, might never work. And for all of those reasons, um, our involvement uh, is valuable. Okay. Um, and so why do we focus on efficacy and uncertainty? That's where OCB really thrives. Um, that's really how we can describe the readiness of a strategy, one that has high efficacy and low uncertainty. Um, and because if we're really honest about the uncertainties, um, that's going to point us to the most urgent research direction. Okay, for me. All right, thanks. So I gave myself the easy job of introducing the speakers. Um, so we have a, a great, uh, fantastic set of speakers for you today. Um, I really think uh, this session came together really nicely with a mix of speakers that we have, and uh, I think it's going to be perfect, not to jinx it at all. Um, but we have, uh, starting with uh, Jinghe uh, uh, or Jinghe at um, uh, Isometric, who's going to be talking about modeling ocean alkalinity enhancement, um, following uh, that, uh, James Gately from UCSB, Gauchos, is going to follow that with uh, a talk about the uh, phytoplankton response to ocean alkalinity enhancement. Um, uh, and then we have, uh, I believe, some lightning talks. Uh, and then um, Julianne D'Angelo from UC Irvine, go Anteaters, um, is going to talk about uh, uh, macroalgae uh, CDR and the uncertainties associated with that. Then we have uh, David Emerson from Bigelow Lab, uh, who's going to talk about a uh, cost model of iron fertilization. After a break, we're going to come back, and uh, Matt Lawn is going to kind of wrap it up for us uh, talking about seaworthy. Um, which is uh, uh, an overview of, of a foundation um, that he's developing. None of the talks are going to go over time, except I just went over time. So <laughs> nothing could possibly go wrong. Um, here's our schedule. Uh, we're going to have uh, some talks. Uh, then we'll give you a break. You can take a nap. Uh, don't be like me and sleep through the rest of the session like I did uh, this morning. Uh, but come back because we have uh, finishing up with a, a panel discussion, which is going to be uh, very exciting, so we're looking forward to it. Uh, yes, so our first talk is going to be by uh, Jing He uh, from Isometric. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much to the session organizers for that great introduction. My name is Jing, and I actually just finished up my PhD in here in the joint program earlier this year, where I was working with Amla Mahadevan. Thank you. <laughs> Wasn't <laughs> expecting or asking for that, but thank you. <laughs> Um, but currently, I'm a carbon removal scientist at Isometric, with which my colleague Sophie Gill introduced earlier today. But just as a reminder, we're a startup working to build scientifically rigorous MRV infrastructure for various CDR and MCDR pathways. But today, I'll be presenting on some work that I've been collaborating with Dr. Mike Taika at Google on ocean alkalinity enhancement. So our framework. Um, for this study is that we really wanted to focus on coastal ocean alkalinity enhancement, and that's just from a practical standpoint, because alkalinity production is most likely going to occur on land where we have access to energy and materials. And then we can imagine that we'll have a fleet of ships that can transport this alkalinity offshore and disperse it. And for the purpose of our study, we're sort of uh, focusing on really rapidly dissolving forms of alkalinity, such as NaOH. So I'll start by just giving an overview of our model, and then the rest of the talk will be focused on two main research questions. 
So part one is looking at what's the global capacity of nearshore OAE. And we also want to do this in a safe way. So, um, in, so as a proxy for safe limits that won't cause too much change to the environment, we set pretty conservative pH constraints. So in our simulations, we say we don't want the pH um, change to be more than 0 0.1 which for context is how much the oceans have acidified already due to human activity. And then for the second part of the talk, um, we look at the temporal and spatial evolution of the CO2 uptake following OAE. So as was introduced um, in the introduction for this session, the uh, main mechanism or OAE will induce a deficit in the pCO2 in the ocean, and then the ocean CO2 uptake occurs when the ocean equilibrates with the atmosphere. That's going to uh, take some time, months to years, for that equilibration and that CO2 uptake to occur. And then throughout the talk, um, I'll try to touch upon some implications for MRV and MCDR uncertainty. So first, just to motivate this a bit more, um, why do we need models for MRV? And obviously, they shouldn't be the only tools, but I'll argue that they are an important tool for us to have in our toolkit. And I hope this point will become much more clear by the end of the talk, but it's really hard to make observations at the spatial and temporal scales that we need. Um, and I just want to highlight the additionality point, because even if we were able to make the most amazing sensors and put them all over the ocean, uh, it still wouldn't be enough to demonstrate additionality, because we only have one Earth, and we, won't, we can never make measurements of a counterfactual Earth. And so I think this is an area where models can really help us, because in simulations, we can obviously run experiments with or without uh, CDR and compare the difference to look at the additionality component. Okay, so the model that we use, um, so our global ocean circulation model uh, takes physical slow fields from the one-third degree ECHO LLC 270 state estimate. What a mouthful. Um, so the state estimate combines the MIT general circulation model with all available data since satellite altimetry in 1992. And it produces uh, these trustworthy flow fields that agree well with observations. And the horizontal resolution is a third of a degree, which is approximately 37 kilometers or so at the equator. And so we can see from this uh, animation of the sea surface temperature in the North Atlantic, this model can somewhat resolve or permit mesoscale eddies. And then on the right, I just want to highlight that the Earth system models that are used in the IPCC reports um, include many more components that we don't have in our model. So we're only focusing on the oceanic component, which is boxed in orange. Um, but Earth system models include uh, modeling the atmospheric dynamics as, all, as well as the dynamics of land systems and interactions between all of those. So that's a limitation that we currently don't have yet. And then as for the carbon cycle model, uh, we use a model of Dukowitz et al. 2005. So it's a relatively simple biogeochemistry model that uh, simulates the cycling of five tracers. They're DIC, alkalinity, phosphate, dissolved organic phosphorus, and dissolved oxygen. Um, our, the model is initialized with observations from GLODAP. And um, there's various sources and sinks for each of these tracers that are parameterized in the model. And I'll also just highlight that here we're keeping the atmospheric pCO2 fixed at 415 parts per million. Okay, so now let's jump into our first question. What is the safe ecological global capacity of nearshore OAE? And in part one, we're really taking a long view, looking far ahead to see if um, the strategy of alkalinity enhancement along coastlines is a scalable solution. So can this get us to gigaton levels of CO2 uptake um, in a safe way? And again, we're defining safe as being within this pretty conservative pH threshold. So the experiments we run to um, answer this question is first we have our reference simulation with no um, alkalinity added. So this is going to be our baseline that we compare the rest of our experiments to. And then we run a series of perturbed simulations with OAE. And again, the OAE is added um, in coastal bands 
So following all global coastlines and the widths of those bands uh, vary between each simulation from about 37 kilometers to 592 kilometers. So since our goal is to maximize the amount of alkalinity added um, without changing the pH by more than 0 0.1, we follow this algorithm outlined up here. So at every time step and for every injection point, we calculate the pH change in that grid point between our perturbed and reference simulation. And if that delta pH is less than our threshold of 0 0.1, then we add alkalinity to the surface at that grid point. But if the delta pH is greater than our threshold, then we skip adding alkalinity at that step. And the plot on the bottom right shows a time series of the uh, change in pH from our perturbed minus reference simulation um, in, in the injection grid point. So this is only in the areas where we're adding alkalinity. And the solid orange line represents the median, and then the shading represents the 10th and 90th percentiles. So you can see that our injection grid cells um, reach an equilibrium after the first three or four years or so, and we also see the seasonal variability. And then the blue line is just showing the total alkalinity added in the model. So we see there's some seasonal variability to that as well. And the map on the top right is showing the change, the average change in pH from year five to the end of our model run. And we can generally see, um, we don't see any that we see like yellows and greens, and those are all change, pH changes of less than 0 0.1, which is what we wanted. So now we can look at the total capacity of this type of OAE strategy. So on this plot, the x-axis is the strip width, and then the y-axis is the global CO2 flux in units of gigatons of CO2 per year. And so we can see that even by limiting our alkalinity addition to these narrow coastline bands, um, we're still able to achieve gigaton levels of CO2 uptake. So this seems, and we still have the very conservative pH constraints. So this seems potentially promising as a scalable solution. And then we can um, break up that blue line into two components. So the gray line is a CO2 flux through our injection grid points. And then the orange line is a CO2 flux um, outside of our injection grid points. And we can see that generally most of the ocean CO2 uptake is not happening in the places where we are adding the alkalinity directly. Instead, the alkalinity gets advected elsewhere, and that's where your CO2 uptake is happening. And then on the map on the right is just showing in a bit more detail the uh, change in the air sea CO2 flux from our perturbed minus reference simulation. Um, and so positive means more CO2 going into the ocean or less outgassing. And we can see the regions of large flux are right along the coastlines where we're directly adding alkalinity, but that makes up a small area. And the rest of the ocean is actually this very light pink color, so it's not white. Um, so we still have a very small positive CO2 flux, but because the oceans are so big, it's such a large area that when you integrate over it, um, the majority of the CO2 flux happens elsewhere. So we can also look at the spatial variability in this steady state alkalinity flux. First, I want to direct your attention to the histogram in the top right corner, um, which just shows that how much alkalinity you can add varies greatly depending on where you are. And this um, alkalinity flux varies by over two orders of magnitude. And in this map, we can uh, see exactly what regions where you're able to add more alkalinity. So for instance, um, the subpolar North Atlantic around Iceland and Greenland are places where you have this blue, which is a high alkalinity addition rate, and also places with strong coastal currents that can quickly disperse the alkalinity also have higher addition rates. Um, I won't spend too much time here, but if we zoom in on particular uh, coastlines, we can see there's also a lot of smaller scale spatial variability in this optimal steady state alkalinity addition. Um, so I think this, is, this has really interesting and important implications for projects that are thinking about their OAE deployment strategies and like what places can they actually add how much alkalinity. But now I want to move on to part two. Um, which is taking a closer look at the equilibration kinetics 
following OAE and what the spatial and temporal variability is. And so this second question is much more relevant for um, smaller quantities and OAE projects. So think of the startups that are actually deploying OAE in these small um, projects for a finite duration in a certain region, and you want to track how much CO2 uptake happens after that. So our simulations are a little different for this part. Uh, we still have our same reference simulation, but for our perturbed simulation with OAE, we add a one-month pulse of alkalinity in a small patch, and then just let the model evolve after that. And then we observe the total CO2 uptake relative to the reference simulation. So here is an example um, where we added alkalinity in a patch off the tip of Brazil. Uh, so in the middle panel here, if you can see the black grid points are the, is the patch where we added alkalinity to. And then the curve on the left is this CO2 uptake curve where time is on the x-axis. And then the y-axis, you can think of it as a CO2 uptake efficiency. So it's how many moles of carbon was absorbed per mole of alkalinity added. We can see for the case that here off of Brazil that this um, CO2 uptake curve, the equilibration happens pretty quickly, so within the first three or four years. And then it reaches a sort of maximum efficiency of 0 0.8, which is the theoretical maximum that we sort of expect and what previous studies have also found. And then if we look at the map, uh, the color is showing the surface pCO2 deficit induced by this uh, alkalinity enhancement. And note that the um, color bar is logged and the units are microatmospheres. So you can see that after one year, so this is still in that um, time when the air sea equilibration is happening, the alkalinity has spread over a really large area, so it's crossed over the entire Atlantic, um, entered the Gulf of Mexico, is in the Gulf Stream, and then the induced PCO2 deficits are extremely small between 0 0.1 and 1 microatmospheres. So this is a huge challenge for measurements and MRV, um, and why we'll need to use models as well. So we can look at the CO2 uptake curves um, across a bunch of different regions now, and for every single one of these lines is a separate pulse experiment, and on the and they are sort of roughly grouped into categories. So in panel A, these are places where we see really fast air sea equilibration, and they sort of reach our maximum efficiency of about 0 0.8. In contrast, in panel C, these are places that have much slower CO2 uptake, and um, some places have a much lower efficiency. So for example, if we look at Iceland, which is the dashed blue line in panel C, we can see that the efficiency is only about 0 0.4 or 5. Um, so overall, we see that this CO2 uptake efficiency varies greatly depending on where you are. And this is actually, I think, a huge source of uncertainty on the amount of carbon removed. And this is a um, challenge that we'll need to figure out for MRV. Okay, so next I want to show, these are some newer simulations uh, that aren't in the paper. And I'll just mention that these experiments are a little bit different in that instead of adding alkalinity, we're directly just removing DIC and directly inducing this um, PCO2 deficit in the model. And so the x-axis on these equilibration curves on the left now, um, it's a what percent equilibration is achieved. And our maximum is 100% equilibrated. Um, but Overall, the idea is still the same. So here we're looking at some spatial variations where our patch is south of Iceland in the top panel and then north of Iceland in the bottom panel. And we can see that um, just by this like, pretty small shift in region, we get very different equilibration kinetics. So south of Iceland, we, get, uh, we only achieve sort of 50% equilibration after 25 years. And this is maybe unsurprising because this is an area of deep convection, so anything that you add to the surface just rapidly sinks out of the um, 
surface and is not in contact with the atmosphere. So you don't have enough time to fully equilibrate with the atmosphere. But then if you move our patch to north of Iceland, uh, I'd love to get a polar oceanographer's take on it, but something about the currents there, you're avoiding the regions of deep convection. We can also look at seasonal variability. So now this is focusing on the patch um, that's north of Iceland. And, okay, I'm almost done. Um, and in all of our previous pulse experiments, our one-month pulse happened in January. But in the bottom panel, we moved the uh, pulse to be in July. And we can see, again, that leads to a very large change in our DIC equilibration curve. So in July, we um, achieve much, we get much more closer to complete equilibration, about 94% after five years. And I think this has to do with the um, large seasonality that you have in the mixed depth in these regions. So in the summer, you have a lot of fresh water from ice melt and you get shallow mixed layer depths. So um, any alkalinity that you add or uh, just remains really close to the surface in contrast in the winter, you get deep mixed layer depth, so alkalinity that you add just gets diluted over a much thicker water column. Uh, but again, all this variability is another large source of uncertainty that we need to better understand. And so as you can see, the space is very complicated, but it's also really exciting, and we'll need many more folks working together on more modeling, but also observational work. And I would just personally love to see a lot more collaboration between industry, government, academia, nonprofits. So please definitely feel free to get in touch if you have any questions, comments, or want to collaborate. And also just a shameless plug that Isometric is hiring for multiple positions, especially scientists. So please come talk to me if you're interested. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jane, for that uh, nice talk. Uh, save your questions for Jane for the uh, um, uh, session later, the panel discussion. And uh, I'd like to introduce James Gately, who's going to be talking about uh, phytoplankton response to OE. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is James Gately, and I'm a fourth-year PhD student and at the University of California, Santa Barbara, at the, in the uh, Iglesias Rodriguez lab. And so today I'm going to be uh, sharing with all of you uh, some uh, responses that we've seen from phytoplankton in both uh, laboratory and uh, mesocosm experiments. And I'm um, excited to share that also the, the our results from the first part of this talk are, will, will be published tomorrow. So, uh, uh, yeah. oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm just gonna I'm not gonna talk about OEE since uh, others have, like Sophie Gill has uh, went in depth on that and did a great job explaining it. So, um, our goals for our laboratory experiments were to assess the uh, functional phytoplankton functional group response to uh, what we refer to as a moderate and a high alkalinity enhancement scenario. These scenarios are based on uh, model predictions from uh, Renforth and Henderson 2017. And so for our uh, moderate alkalinity addition, we increased, uh, we added 750 micromoles per kilogram of alkalinity, bringing the total alkalinity to around 3,000 micromoles per kilogram. And for our high alkalinity addition, we added uh, 2,800 micromoles per kilogram of alkalinity, bringing total alkalinity to around 5,000 micromoles. And these two scenarios um, in the Renforth and Henderson paper represent a, um, a, an extensive alkalinity addition uh, with global impacts um, for the moderate, and then a, um, for the high alkalinity addition is perhaps like a, a, hot, a, region, a regional hot spot with alkalinity that may be at an ejection site. And so I have a quick vi oh, the video doesn't work. Okay, so I um, had a video originally, but the uh, picture here shows our laboratory setup. So we used one liter cultures and uh, put them in, and held them in two liter polycarbonate bottles. And then we filtered, or we uh, bubbled those with 420 parts per million uh, CO2 air to simulate uh, uh, gas exchange with the ocean and, and, and atmosphere. And then at each, repl uh, each sampling point, we uh, sacrificed triplicate uh, replicates. And oh, so the two organism, organisms we studied, we wanted to look at a representative calcifier and a representative silicifier. So we collected uh, Miliania huxleyi for our calcifier and a species of Catoceros for our silicifier. So to prepare our experiment, we collected water from the Santa Barbara Channel, and then we added nutrients to uh, make sure that uh, nutrient limitation didn't play a role um, in, in our experiment. 
and then we added alkalinity. So one thing we found, uh, interestingly, that was when we tried to use the actual OAE minerals, for example, we, we tried uh, quicklime, uh, we were not able to rapidly uh, uh, bring the alkalinity to the, where we wanted it to. Um, so instead, just so we, could, so we could focus on the biological uh, response to alkalinity enhancement, we decided to simulate it with what we refer to as a limestone-inspired alkalinity addition, where we added, a, uh, calcium, chloride, we added cal calcium chloride dihydrate and uh, sodium carbonate. And that was able to rapid, uh, rapidly dissolve and get the alkalinities we were seeing. Then we filter ster sterilized the media and aliquoted those out into our, um, into our bottles. And uh, prior to inoculating the cultures, uh, inoculating the uh, media with phytoplankton, we also bubbled it uh, for about 96 hours to bring the, the rest of the carbonate chemistry system into the, uh, the model, uh, predicted model scenarios. And we also ensured uh, prior to inoculating uh, the media that the phytoplankton were in exponential growth. And so interesting, interestingly, what we found was that uh, both, both taxa grew very well in even the very high alkalinity conditions. So as you can see, the log cell abundances were well constrained across, across treatments. And we also saw that there was no difference, uh, there were no statistical differences in growth rates or generation times for either taxa. And um, so our, at least with Emiliania huxleyi, uh, it seemed, uh, you know, this, we've uh, talked today a little bit about the uh, wide ocean scenario that might uh, result with a calcium-based alkalinity addition, and at least with this specific calcifier, that we didn't, uh, we didn't see any energetic advantage uh, from, uh, from alkalinity addition with calcium. So we also, and sorry for the small text here, but uh, we also looked at the elemental composition of and, and ratios for our, each taxa. And so at the, at the top left, starting, we have uh, particulate organic carbon, and we have particulate inorganic carbon on the right. We also looked at uh, particulate, particulate organic nitrogen, the pixopoc ratio, and the TLC to PON. And we saw no uh, correlation between uh, any of these and uh, in alkalinity. Interestingly, though, we did see a moderate reduction in uh, the photosynthetic quantum yield, for, uh, or the FE over FM, for the species. Um, so I will say they were still healthy. Like they're, as you can see, the values are above 0.6, which are, there's, uh, at this point, they're, they're still um, healthy uh, FE over FM. But, we did see up to a 3% reduction in the, in the highest alkalinity. Um, we're not certain uh, what the cause of this is. We think there, uh, it might be due to reductions in, um, in availability of micronutrients, which I'll talk about um, our reasoning uh, for that here in a bit, uh, but we're not sure what, what occurred here. And for catastrophes, uh, looking at you know, POC, PON as well, and we also looked at the ratio of biogenic silicon to both POC and PON. And again, we did not uh, see any correlation between uh, these ratios or, or total alkalinity. However, again, we did see this reduction in FE over FM. And, <clears throat> excuse me, before I move on to talking about the precipitates that we saw, um, you'll, you'll notice that some of the data points here, um, instead of being open circles, are open triangles. And those are representative of uh, carbonate chemistry samples that we saw reverse weathering in. Um, now, we don't necessarily think that occurred while we were growing the cultures. And I say that because when we were collecting our carbonate chemistry samples, we uh, filtered them through a 0.2 micron filter uh, to remove both the cells in culture as well as the precipitates that did form in culture that I'm going to talk about on the next slide, uh, just like what affects our, our, type, our, our analysis. Um, so we think they would, it didn't happen in culture because the, the white colored precipitates that we saw through this reverse weathering actually was in our carbonate chemistry sample bottles. So we think that it occurred here in storage. Uh, so they are excluded from statistical analysis uh, here, but we included the data points. Um, And so um, I talked about the precipitates that we've seen in culture, and this is an example of just one of them. Um, unfortunately, we're not able to quantify like, uh, how, like what they were actually comprised of. Um, we just have a few SEM images that, uh, that, we, that we can uh, refer to. But we did see that, as you can see at the on the top right, there's uh, iron um, in these precipitates, as well as silicon and phosphorus. Um, and this is from our uh, high alkalinity treatments from, and this is an abiotic treatment. Um, so we did see these precipitates, and um, we think it might be a function of pH along with alkalinity, but uh, we're not quite sure. And so we think, you know, going back to the reduced FE over FMs that we saw, we think that perhaps the reduced iron concentrations could be, could be leading to those reductions, but again, we're not certain. And notice in the last, uh, the last 
slide, we, we saw silicon in the uh, precipitate, and that um, pairs nicely with what we saw in our dissolved uh, silicate concentrations, where we saw an up to 18% reduction in dissolved uh, silicate in our highest alkalinity. Um, and like I said, we're not, we're not able to quantify where that's going, but um, that is an interesting result that we saw. And then uh, as far as dissolved inorganic phosphorus, we saw the opposite. Um, the control in moderate was uh, rel um, relatively close, but we saw an up to 18, uh, up to 8% increase in dissolved inorganic phosphorus in our culture. So we'll say um, that these, we did add nutrients, as I said, and so all the nutrient that was, nutrient concentrations in our cultures are, are higher than what's going to be in natural water. So determining how, how nutrients in actual natural seawater is uh, an important component to assessing uh, the safety of uh, ocean alkaline enhancement. And on top of that, uh, even though the results are real, uh, encouraging, we mostly saw a neutral response in both taxa. These are uh, you know, representative species, so you know, let's be cautious in extrapolating uh, what we see in single species out to, to ecosystems. So with that in mind, we, all, we wanted to uh, move on to do an uh, mesocosm experiment. And for these, we actually, uh, our tanks are here on the uh, left side of the screen. And we collected water from the Santa Barbara Channel as before, but instead of filter ster uh, adding the nutrients and filter sterilizing it, uh, we simply, uh, we, we did filter sterilize our blanks, our negative controls, but for our culture containing vessels, we simply filter them through a 200 micron mesh filter to remove the grazers. And then uh, we did not add nutrients, and then we added the alkalinity spikes and put them in. And um, in the last experiment, I mentioned we bubbled the 420 parts per million to air. In this scenario, we uh, just uh, used aquarium pump to pull air directly out, um, from the surrounding surrounding area, and we filtered it prior to the end. The filter downstream of that. And we also, with these mesocosm experiments, we're interested in the temp, uh, assessing the temporal, uh, including a temporal component to them. So the Santa Barbara Channel is uh, very dynamic. Um, as you can see here, we have two major currents that impact uh, the channel. We have the California current that comes down from the north and enters the channel from the, uh, the west, uh, west side of the channel. And then we have the Southern California countercurrent that comes from the east side of the channel. And based on the time of year, uh, the, which dominates varies. And we can also get uh, eddies that form and propagate across the channel. So uh, these, both of these water masses have distinct chemical signatures and uh, nutrient concentrations, which can impact uh, phytoplankton community structure. So uh, we decided we want to look at this at different times of the year to uh, see if there were any differences based on phytoplankton community structure at, at that time. Fortunately, uh, um, I guess I should mention too, the one on the left is representative more of a relaxation versus the one on the right being upwelling, um, where upwelling being where the California current is dominating uh, the channel. So <clears throat> unfortunately, the first experiment we ran where it's more towards relaxation uh, in the summer of 2022, uh, we had contamination in our uh, negative controls, so that data um, was unfortunately not usable. But uh, we just ran a recent experiment uh, just uh, about a month ago uh, during uh, upwelling season, and I uh, have a little bit of data to share, uh, not much, unfortunately. We're, uh, we're mainly interested in looking at phytoplankton community structure by DNA analysis, which we have not yet done, but we do have some nutrient data that I wanted to share with you today, since we talked about nutrients earlier. Um, so the culture-containing vessels, uh, we saw that it was uh, the, the nutrient drawdown was similar uh, across treatments by day five. Most of the nutrients had been used up. And however, this really doesn't tell us a whole lot about uh, the phytoplankton community um, without, without the uh, DNA data. But uh, you know, we have the dissolved silica drawdown, so there's likely diatoms there at least. But um, that's something we hope, hope to have uh, information on soon. But I think what's interesting uh, with, this, with uh, this data is that the abiotic vessels, we actually did not see the same trend in the nutrients. So, uh, DIN and DIP, uh, there's a little bit of variation there, but the standard deviations overlap. Um, but for the dissolved uh, silicate, we actually saw the, the, op uh, the opposite trend here. We were seeing higher, uh, higher uh, concentrations in our alkalinity uh, addition cultures. I will say, too, that we, in, in these, we did not bring it all the way up to 5,000. We only brought it up to 3,000. And we used, uh, in addition to our limestone-inspired method, we also used NA NAOH. So, um, but that, I think that's something interesting that, uh, that we drew from these experiments. And that's kind of where we're at. We're hoping to have our uh, DNA data soon and uh, learn more about what happens to the actual phytoplankton community structure under these conditions.
So uh, some uncertainties that we can draw from our experiments then are, you know, what are the long-term effects of OAE? Uh, our experiments really only assess short-term acclimation. We had them in culture for up to, up to 10 days. And um, so if, for example, the FE over a film, if that trend continues on a, on a long-term basis, that, that could be a concern. And uh, also, what is, uh, how does alkaline addition affect dissolved inorganic nutrients as we're seeing um, different trends based on whether we add nutrients or using natural, uh, natural nutrient concentrations. And then also establishing TA and TH thresholds as we saw the reverse weathering. If that were to occur, if, if these minerals were added or alkaline in general added in, um, re in reverse weathered, that would defeat the purpose of, of adding it. And then also uh, how to efficiently alkalinize seawater because Again, we had, like for example, with quicklime, we had to use a, a simulated method of doing so. so. This is a major uncertainty, Zutru. And thank you for your time. I have some of our funders here. And I'll have to, thank you. So uh, my question is about your FE over FM numbers. They actually didn't look to me, they looked actually pretty good. Do you have any other observations that might tell you that you know those the high alkalinity treatments were were more de detrimental than the lower ones? No, I mean, um, yeah, as we as, as I mentioned, like we, they were healthy cells. Like those FEO gram values are are all healthy, but we did see that just a negative trend. So um, we weren't we don't think that it really affected the phytoplankton in, in a negative way in culture. It's, it, it wasn't manifest in our or any, any of our uh, ratios either. So that's just, yeah, about long-term trends. How about now? Okay. Great talk, James. Um, with your mesocosm experiments, you equilibrated your single culture experiments with air. Right. Mesocosm experiments were not they were air equilibrated, so the pH is going to be significantly higher. It was. Okay. Even with the limestone. Right. Uh, uh, it air. was around 8.5 8 .8 with the limestone inspired and up to around 8.5. Nine-ish for the uh, NA NAOH. Okay. Thanks. It, was there? Do you think there was any contamination of silica in your sodium hydroxide? Do you think that? I don't, don't think so. But we didn't assess it. We, uh, we, I'm not certain though. Okay. We're filtered. We filtered them before. Okay. Thanks, James. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you, James, for that uh, great talk there. Uh, so now for something completely different, we have some lightning talks uh, by Adam Subas, uh, Mallory Greenham, and uh, Natalia Evans. Uh, so prepare for those, and then we'll have a few more uh, plenary talks. I'm Adam Subas. I'm an assistant scientist here at Woods Hole. Um, I don't have a name tag. I'm kind of lurking for this session, um, but uh, happy to talk to anyone um, at the coffee break or the email or whatever. I'm introducing with my lightning talk the Lock Nest project. Um, it's a hui based project standing for locking away ocean carbon in the Northeast Shelf and Slope. Um, it is a large multidisciplinary uh, project focused on assessing ocean alkalinity enhancement uh, in the Northeast region. We're um, trying to put hui's unique uh, engineering and scientific capabilities to work on answering some of these big open questions about the feasibility and safety of ocean alkalinity enhancement. Um, the main goals of this are to really gain practical experience developing, uh, deploying alkalinity from ships uh, to develop MRV and environmental impact frameworks. Um, combined with this um, field experience component, um, we're building decision support tools using machine learning algorithms and pairing these algorithms and experiments with regional ocean models for robust assessments of OAE feasibility. Um, this is funded uh, primarily by the Carbon to Sea Initiative, which is a new initiative that just launched last week. Um, it is a private um, nonprofit philanthropic organization putting the science of OAE uh, before we try to make money on it. Um, and we're really trying to answer these questions to assess uh, if this is actually a scalable solution um, to the climate crisis or not. Um, the team, I'm the lead PI. Uh, I have my, my background in um, geochemistry, uh, alkalinity and carbon cycling in the ocean. We've got Heather Kim uh, doing machine learning and data assimilation, Anna Michelle, uh, who's an expert in sensors and chemical mapping, Jenny Ruben, who's part-time in 
uh, Woods Hole Sea Grant, uh, really uh, bringing this um, research out to our stakeholders and engaging with them. Uh, Jason Caput is our senior engineer. Alec Wong is a um, uh, carbonate chemist. Ke Chen uh, is leading the ocean modeling, and Dan McCorkle is advising us on uh, mineral formation and, and um, biomineralization. Um, the uh, project launched uh, officially in January of this year. We've been starting to build our machine learning um, uh, tools. Uh, I'm sorry that I can't share any of this science with you because I only have three minutes, but I'm happy to talk about any of the actual details of all this um, later on. Um, that machine learning piece is going to sort of evolve into a large ROMS project. We are hiring for a ROMS postdoc. If anyone's interested, please talk to me. The ad isn't out yet, but I'm happy to um, uh, talk with you if you're interested. Um, the meat of the project is three field trials um, that will increase in both scope and scale over the next three years. The first one is this August. We're going to do a tracer release um, and track that tracer release around um, south of Martha's Vineyard here. Next year, next summer, we're going to release alkalinity in the form of sodium hydroxide along with that um, tracer. And then trial three is going to be the summer of 2025 off of a full-blown um, UNOLS research vessel, Armstrong or similar, um, in the Gulf of Maine, ideally. Um, uh, and we're going to be doing a very similar set of things, but with hopefully a lot more people and a lot bigger scale on um, permits pending. So um, that is a big source of um, uncertainty, uh, as we've been talking about uh, for this project. Um, and then finally, we're going to wrap this all up and hopefully get some uh, clarity on what this actually might look like in the region. Um, what does this field trial look like? We're, as I said, we're going to take a research vessel with state-of-the-art instrumentation underway, towed vehicles. We're going to be putting out Lagrangian drifters with sensors, uh, CTD rosettes. We're going to try to look at this thing with drones and also with satellites from space. Um, uh, we hopefully are going to get some gliders in the water as well um, with both fluorescence and BGC Argo sensors. Um, and the real goal here is to track this alkalinity that we add around, measure how much CO2 um, gets taken up, and then also assess any environmental impacts along the way. Um, and, you know, the, the goal really here is to throw all the tools that we can at this thing. I will end there. I'll also say best practices guide. I'm a part of this. Preprints are available now for having town halls at AGU and OSM. Uh, and uh, check that out as well. Thank you. The speaker is coming up right now. Mallory. Uh, great to follow Adam on that one. So if I haven't met you yet, I'm Mallory. I finished my PhD in Alex lab, Alec Wong's lab, building the Chanus 2 DIC sensor a few years ago. Since then, I've been a postdoc at Stony Brook working on ocean alkalinity enhancement in laboratory tank experiments. And since then, I've recently joined the startup world trying to commercialize ocean alkalinity enhancement from coastal settings. So um, for Ebb Carbon, I am the head of MRV, and we're developing how, how we think about this moving forward. Um, so thankfully, we've had some OAE talks already, but it's important to remember that there's a variety of different types of alkalinity sources, ranging from um, aqueous to solid minerals that can be processed in different ways, dispersed in different ways, tracked in different ways. So any MRV that we build in this space in the immediate future is really going to be built for purpose. And um, you can see a couple of the different types of reactions that we're tracking, broadly ground minerals on the bottom here, broadly sodium hydroxide in an aqueous form at the top where we're affecting a pH change. And in either case, in any case, what we're really looking at is this air sea disequilibrium in PCO2 that drives CO2 into the ocean. So the ED process specifically is working with electrodialysis, processing saltwater or brine input streams through uh, bipolar membranes that separate out the acid and base. The acid is a waste stream that can go into other types of enhanced mineralization schemes, and the base is recombined with seawater and returned to the ocean as your alkalinity. So this unit on the top right was recently delivered to a test site in partnership with NOAA and PNNL up in the Pacific Northwest. So MRV in a contained body of seawater is a little bit more simple to track than in the field. So at Stony Brook for the past year or so, we've been doing contained seawater trials, 6,000 liters or so, control and experiment tanks. We've been tracking this change in DIC in response to a sodium hydroxide alkalinity uptake. That work is in preparation now, so keep an eye out for it. 
But as soon as you move into the field, things get really complicated. So what we can control is that alkaline decharacterization, what we are dispensing from our stacks that we can really monitor. And to some extent, dilution monitoring in uh, outfalls from pipes for industry in general is something that we can do, but there's a limit to what you can actually sense in the near field. And all of the carbon removal that we are looking at from the atmosphere is happening downstream, and that is all of the modeling world that we need to worry about. Um, recently, we've been seeing a lot of really interesting sensor projects that are looking to get into this space from broader industries. So if you're just getting into observing marine organic carbon, um, Ellen Briggs and I wrote this primer that's an ACS in focus that kind of wraps up what sensors are out there, what are the immediate future research ones, uh, not yet including any of the really cool ARPA projects. What we don't always include in MRV, so in the industrial world or in the carbon credit world, MRV is usually for carbon credits for carbon removal, where is the carbon going? And environmental impacts aren't really explicitly included in that. So that's something that we're really working to understand with partners at PNNL, NOAA, a variety of other groups. And that includes the laboratory ecotoxicity related experiments in the lab, ranging out to the types of near field monitoring, community assessments, and so on. Um, so if you're interested in any of these topics, my email is at the bottom. We're working on Long Island um, at Flax Pond Marine Lab with Stony Brook, doing a variety of MRV projects in our salt marsh as well as some other partner field sites. Um, so this is a really broad area, and the message I want to get across is right now, MRV in the industrial setting does not mean always what we think about MRV in the ocean world. And we even argued about this quite a bit at the URI OCB conference in September. What does MRV even mean? Is it measuring? Is it monitoring? Is it modeling? Is it validation, verification? And we're, we're kind of uh, working our way through to what that looks like. And I think that is just about on time. Yeah. Great. Natalia Evans, uh, talk about biomass storage and anoxic base. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm Natalia Evans. I'm currently a postdoc in Dr. Morgan Raven's lab, and I'm investigating the feasibility of biomass storage in anoxic marine basins. Here is a brief scheme overviewing different types of biomass storage. On this side, we see the idea of sinking biomass, often kelp, onto the oxic seafloor, notably this has a plume release of remineralized material, as well as it impacts benthic heterotrophs there. There's also been discussion of nutrient fertilization, such as iron fertilization, in which we induce biomass growth, which then sinks. However, it's often attenuated by nutrient uptake and export efficiency. The technique I'm investigating is terrestrial biomass placement in anoxic basins. It has a couple of advantages, such as the slow degradation as well as the fact that, unlike for nutrient fertilization, the biomass exists already, which is convenient. We're specifically sourcing agricultural waste, corn stover, short-hand bagasse, because gigaton scale materials and infrastructure to move it around already exists. In addition, terrestrial biomass is rich in woody polymers like lignin, which are highly recalcitrant to break down in the absence of oxygen. The Black Sea would be the ideal location for this type of CDR at scale. On the left plot, we see the best symmetry of the Black Sea. You'll notice that the cell depth is quite shallow compared to the very deep range, and the aerial extent of the basin is quite large. These are great advantages for trying to put a good deal of biomass, which we're going to do. In addition, there is over 100 micromolar sulfide, which preserves biomass as well. My PI, Morgan, made a very first principles box model to simulate placing 20 petagrams of organic matter into this basin. In this, over a uh, thousand years, you'll see about 40 caramels of carbon released in this sort of first principles. It's interesting that the amount of sulfide produced is on the same scale as you'd expect for the 20th century eutrophication that happened in the surface, whereas we're releasing this into the deep ocean or the deep basin. It also has a range of alkalinities. Uh, one of the things that we're focusing on in our project is determining the relative contribution of sulfate reduction versus methanogenesis on the biomass breakdown, notably that the sulfate reduction minimizes pH change compared to other processes. Here is that box model result where you put the 20 petagrams there, and you don't really see significant release of that biomass until about 1,000 years later where it hits the surface. If you're interested in learning more about this, I've got a poster like, by the second aisle down from the Vico table. In addition, the preprint with 
this data as well as some other basins that's currently available on ESS OAR. I'd like to acknowledge my PI and the other postdoc, Aaron Martinez, is working on this project right now, my other lab members, as well as the Grantham Foundation for funding and Carboniferous for supplying us with biomass. Lightning, folks, we are zooming along. Very nice, very nice. <laughs> um, so uh, next up, uh, we have uh, Julianne D'Angelo um, to talk about the uncertainties of macroalgae farming for uh, CDR. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Julianne. I'm a fourth-year PhD student at UC Irvine um, in the Department of Earth System Science. And I'm going to switch gears a little bit and start talking about the economic feasibility, or lack thereof, of uh, marine CDR methods, um, since this is an important consideration for even if these things are uh, effective and we can reduce some of the biophysical and biogeochemical uncertainties, would people actually want to do this compared to other forms of CDR or compared to emissions mitigation in the first place? Um, I guess a little disclaimer is that I'm not an oceanographer by training. I led the economic work on this, and I'm going to be presenting some work led by my collaborators um, to try to highlight the most important physical and biogeochemical uncertainties since that's the expertise in the room, and I'm really excited to have discussions with you all about that um, in the panel and afterwards. So just to frame a little bit, um, since we've been talking mostly about other marine CDR methods so far, um, which are also awesome and I've learned so much, um, the uh, basis for uh, seaweed farming for MCDR, um, people are excited about it for a lot of reasons. It has some potential uh, cost resource advantages and can potentially be very scalable. Um, particularly compared to um, land-based biomass methods for carbon removal. It has some advantages. Um, this would be similar for something like um, iron fertilization um, or other uh, biological MCDR methods. Um, there's no freshwater application needed. It, for the most part, no fertilizer is needed. Um, and it doesn't displace agricultural land since there's um, competition for land use already and demand for agricultural products. Um, it could also potentially mitigate ocean acidification. I know that there's also some pushback on that in terms of <laughs> when the carbon actually re-equilibrates, if that's true, but excited to have discussions about that as well. Um, and on the kind of economic side, there's potential for polyculture. So seaweed farmers could co-locate um, seaweed farms with other aquaculture, like oyster farming or something like that, um, potentially have that as a source of revenue to, to fund their seaweed cedar operations. Um, but the impacts on the ecosystems and the system-wide efficiency and the permanence or durability, as we've been calling it, their, of their removal are all active research questions. So on the right here, this is a figure adapted from the National Academies report on uh, marine CDR that came out a couple of years ago, um, basically just showing the mechanism for seaweed farming, harvesting, and sinking for CDR. So the seaweed grows in the euphotic zone, takes up carbon from the surface DIC pool, and then sinks. Um, the amount that makes it to the bottom is a question that is important to consider. Um, but if we assume that it all makes it to the bottom, um, the biomass can either be uh, buried in the sediment and then stored for longer periods of time, or some of it can um, remineralize. And then the durability of that remineralized carbon um, relates to the potential leakage rate and, and how long it could stay sequestered. Um, and then what actually removes carbon from the atmosphere is the re-equilibration of the uh, atmospheric CO2 with the surface carbon pool. When we started this work, this really cool paper um, by Froelich et al. was, at least to our knowledge, kind of the first attempt to look at this globally, like how, where can we grow seaweed, where, is the, uh, where are the best locations for the potential to scale up seaweed aquaculture for CDR. Um, so based on this analysis, um, it was mostly a stoichiometric analysis using ambient entity ratios. Uh, they found that about 48 million square kilometers of the oceans are suitable for seaweed aquaculture um, within exclusive economic zones. So slightly closer to shore environments. Um, and our research wanted to build on this um, and study questions like what about outside of the EZs? What if you wanted to farm and sink seaweed in the open ocean? Um, and also what are other biophysical drivers of yield other than the ambient nutrient um, stoichiometry? Um, and finally, the work that I led was about the economic feasibility of doing this at scale. So uh, rough outline of our methods. So to evaluate the potential on both of these fronts, we need to know several things. First, how much seaweed can you grow? Um, and we wanted to try to bring in a dynamic seaweed growth model to address that on a global scale. Second, what is the CDR efficiency or additionality? And third, how much does it cost to produce? So kind of broken up into biophysical and economic limits. Um, in each case, we discovered there are huge sources of uncertainty, which uh, I'm hoping to highlight in this talk. 
um, really exciting areas for future research. Um, but we wanted to understand like the order of magnitude potential to see if it was really worth investigating at this scale in the first place um, and identify those sources of uncertainty for future work. Um, yeah, that's basically what I just said too. So I'm going to start with the techno-economic assessment, which is what I led, um, and use that to, like I said, kind of frame the most important biophysical uncertainties that are driving a lot of this economic uncertainty. So the techno-economic model tries to answer how much um, would seaweed MCDR cost compared to other forms of CDR um, or compared to using seaweed for other ways to mitigate emissions. So you have all the seaweed that you're growing and harvesting. Is the best thing to do with it to sink it for CDR or would the best thing to do with it be to use it for products that might displace demand for other emissions-intensive agricultural products, and that might be cheaper. Um, so the inputs that we have into this model are first estimates of seaweed yield, which are coming from the biophysical model, which I'll talk about after. Um, but in addition to that, uh, we have inputs of things like capital costs, so the costs associated with the physical materials needed to start up and, and maintain a seaweed farm. Those include lines, anchors, buoys, boats, and all those things also have expected lifetimes. So they degrade over time, and so we've uh, annualized the costs associated with also replacing those over their expected lifetimes. And those things could be impacted by waves and depth. So we have inputs there that um, scale the cost based on how wavy it is or how deep you have to anchor your farm. We also have operating costs um, and the emissions associated with doing those operating uh, activities. So we kind of net out like what the emissions benefit would be compared to the emissions of running the seaweed per operations. Um, those include things like labor, transport, and also insurance and licenses for the farm. And those are also impacted by how far away from shore you're trying to do this. Then there's also the costs associated with harvesting. So in order to get a lot of seaweed biomass for some species, you need to do multiple harvests because you could have effects within the seaweed canopy that slow down their growth efficiency over time. And so each of those harvests also has associated costs. So you might kind of be essentially running in place if it costs more to get more seaweed growth for each harvest. Um, so we tried to capture that uh, interplay as well. And then on the kind of alternative uses for seaweed side, we said, well, what if you don't use the seaweed for CDR? What if you use it for products? And so for each product, we have to consider the market value of the existing uh, commodity that the seaweed might be replacing, um, and also the conversion costs associated with turning that seaweed into something. Um, and then relating to the durability and additionality, we are including hypothetical factors of the atmospheric removal fraction. So that's kind of our way of assessing how much additional CDR would this actually be taking out of the atmosphere, and how would that impact the cost overall, um, and how much of that seaweed would actually remain sequestered, or the carbon would remain sequestered um, for a timeline we picked 100 years, but you can do different timelines for that as well. And so because there was so much uncertainty in these cost parameters, um, spoiler alert, it's really hard to get people who run seaweed farms to tell you their costs because they don't want to fill out surveys. And a lot of companies that are trying to do this, this stuff is proprietary, and so they are not willing to share that information. But So we went with the best available literature data, and there was a wide range for all these costs. So we did a Monte Carlo analysis, um, which basically means for each parameter, there was an uncertainty bound in the cost that we found. Um, we used the uniform distributions, so that middle one, B, because we didn't have enough data to feel confident in doing another shape of distribution. Um, and so we ran the model multiple times, like thousands of times, and each time it took a different value from within that uncertainty range for each parameter. And that gives you a better sense of the kind of full out, output space um, and what's most likely and least likely. So these are the results for CDR in the top left, panel A, and then also using seaweed for food, animal feed or biofuels. Um, the yellow here is cheaper. And so what you might notice um, first off is that the, uh, the CDR is a bit expensive. For people who are thinking about um, CDR costs, they tend to target more like the $100 to $200 per ton of carbon uh, CO2 range. Um, and so oh, oh, sorry, I perhaps mentioned that the, the numbers are the cost for the cheapest 1% area of ocean, which is roughly like twice the size of Alaska, so massive area. We could reach gigaton scales even before that, but we just wanted to give a sense of what the cheapest areas of the ocean look like in terms of costs. Um, and then for the food, feed, and biofuel, you might notice that the spatial patterns are a bit different. They're kind of more close to shore in most places. That's because the transport mechanism we had um, is related to how much biomass you're actually hauling around. And so you have to get it to shore to use it for things, as opposed to in the CDR space, you're sinking it usually close to where you grow it. Um, but these tend to be much cheaper, like I mentioned, because you can get more bang for your buck if you're um, mitigating or, or avoiding. This is like a contentious area in the CDR world, but if you're avoiding emissions, um, then you can be avoiding things like methane or nitrous oxide emissions that, um, that give you more uh, carbon benefit per dollar. Now I want to talk about the sensitivities of it. So um, on the left-hand side, we did a random forest analysis of the cheapest areas in the ocean. 
um, to see what parameters are having the biggest impact on the cost variability. Um, and so what you can see is that the ones in uh, the seaweed yield and the atmospheric removal fraction are those biophysical factors. Um, so each time we ran the Monte Carlo, we also altered the seaweed yield input, um, and that had a really huge impact on the cost, understandably, um, and also the additionality had a big impact on the cost. Uh, and the impact of the yield is shown over here. The histogram of the cheapest areas been by whether you had more seaweed than the median, the median map, or the lower seaweed growth. Um, and then on the economic side, the seeded line costs and the capital costs had a substantial impact as well. So that's basically the cost to actually prepare the line uh, in a hatchery to get it onto the, the, you grow the seaweed on and get it out there. There was a really big variability in the literature for those costs as well, and it's unclear how those costs would change if you scale up to the, and you kind of have learning curves of things getting cheaper. So that's an area for research as well. So now moving on to the biophysical model. Um, this is a uh, model that tries to answer, like, basically how much seaweed can we grow globally and what are the key uncertainties with that. So it has environmental inputs of nutrients, light, temperature, waves, and currents. Um, and then there are a bunch of, oh, they didn't quite trans, so they're overlapping a little, but uh, they have these parameters related to the biophysical growth of seaweed, things related to how quickly and how much nutrients the seaweed uh, requires to grow and stay healthy. Um, also, light dependencies and um, intercanopy effects are represented by a density limit. Um, and then finally, there's some mortality factors, exudation and death rates that relate to how quickly seaweed dies and how much nutrient, or how many nutrients it's able to actually retain as it grows. Some more details here. The model is called, we call it MACMOD, Macroalgae Cultivation Modeling System. Um, it models four types of seaweed that cover 95% of the most commonly cultivated species, um, and it includes type-specific seeding and harvesting schedules. The resolution is a 12th of a degree globally, which is about nine kilometers of the equator, um, and it uses one-day time steps. And to get at the potential for uh, nutrient availability and competition with other species, we modeled two nutrient scenarios. One is an ambient nutrient scenario where seaweed in the model has access to nitrate at the background surface concentrations without any competition. Um, and it, at this level, the nutrients would be depleted pretty quickly. So in reality, this is overly optimistic. Seaweed probably wouldn't grow this much if you aggregated it over large areas, but this is just to get a sense of maybe the upper bound. Um, and then the limited nutrient scenario was our attempt to try to, to kind of bound those nutrients with something that uh, is biophysically limiting like nutrients. Um, and so this is where seaweed growth only has ac access to the upward flux of nitrate uh, within the ocean on those time steps. And it turns out those nutrient assumptions are really important. Um, on the left-hand side, where it has access to all of the ambient nutrients, um, the, the yellow here is if you have more seaweed growth. Um, you can see there's really, really large productivity in the equatorial Pacific. And um, on the right-hand side, the limited nitrate case, that's still the most productive area, but um, across the board, there's much lower uh, growth rates, uh, much lower harvest. And then on the bottom, we've got the preferred seaweed type. So all these are all the inputs of the economic model as well. We are inputting which seaweed type accumulates the most biomass and grows the best. So in the equatorial Pacific, it's tropical red seaweeds mostly, and then in the um, higher latitudes, temperate brown seaweeds like kelps. Um, and on the panels on the side here, you can see that the comparison to phytoplankton net primary productivity not to directly compare them, but just to get a sense of the uh, scale that we're talking about and why the ambient nutrient scenario is so overly optimistic. Um, that in, it's, it's a lot higher than phytoplankton NPP in, in most regions, um, except for the equatorial Pacific. Uh, phytoplankton, I believe, is limited mostly by iron. So uh, iron supplementation is an assumption in our model that we think that farmers of seaweed could, could supplement iron, um, but that's obviously open for discussion as well. So the major factors of uncertainty here, there was, there was also a Monte Carlo simulation in this uh, analysis, um, are the mortality factors, which really don't have very good data. So that's something that we found out would be really great to know to improve the model and be able to predict these yields better. Um, and then in some of the lower harvest uh, areas, the maximum growth rate was also a really important factor. So some takeaways and next steps. How am I doing on that? Oh, I'm good. Okay. Um, so it's possible to sequester large amounts of carbon by farming and sinking seaweed at the Agaton scale. Um, but uh, the, what we didn't cover in our study, which obviously is very important, um, is that the impacts of ocean ecosystems uh, are, are unclear at this scale. And it may be cost prohibitive depending on some key uncertainties and would take up a lot of ocean area. So to reach Gigaton scale, just for context, 
would probably require, at least based on our results, an area between the size of Montana and California, like somewhere in that range, um, just for farming seaweed, so that's pretty large. And then I want to spend a few minutes talking about the future research needs here. Um, basically, we want to be able to better answer how can we predict yield uh, with a, you know, reduce those uncertainty ranges um, and try to get better, uh, more at this uh, additionality factor. So firstly, uh, mon monitoring biomass growth to ensure that the growth that's predicted actually occurs for all different ways of farming seaweed. Um, and also knowing where the seaweed sinks is important because not all sinking locations are created equal. Um, depending on where the seaweed sinks and how much of it remineralizes, it could stay sequestered for not very long at all or a long time. And so being able to, to know that and predict that is important to validate CDR using seaweed. Um, and like I said, more data about mortality factors is going to be really important. So actual experiments and monitoring understanding at current seaweed farms, how quickly the seaweed dies and what factors are controlling that are very important. Um, and finally, I want to emphasize with these yield results, we did not directly model competition with phytoplankton, which is, uh, or other biological productivity, which is a huge um, source of uncertainty and also going to be super important for actually understanding the eff efficacy of the uh, carbon removal from seaweed farming. And so integration into our system models was, is, you know, this is kind of evolving as you're doing the study. That's the next logical step. Since we've done this, there are a couple of really cool papers that have come out um, showing that additionality could be as low as 60% on average in the EEZs when modeled using competition with phytoplankton. Um, and regionally, it could actually lead to an increase in outcasting, depending on where you do it, uh, or it could be about 85% efficient. Um, so the next step in my mind would be to potentially integrate a dynamic growth model like this into an Earth system model um, and also model potential outside of EEZs. So on the economic side, um, I'm personally interested in how quickly economies of scale would reduce costs if we were doing this at the gigaton scale. Particularly the cost of offshore anchoring, there is not a lot of data on that because we don't really do anything like that in the open ocean right now. We don't have seaweed farms in the middle of the equatorial Pacific. Um, so how quickly those costs for anchoring increase is going to be really important. And like I mentioned, the um, hatchery costs as well. Finally, I couldn't do this talk without mentioning alternative farming methods because there are a lot of startups in this space that are not doing conventional long line seaweed farming with anchors. There's a lot of excitement for um, seed and release buoy type seaweed farming or like autonomous floating seaweed farms that free float around. That's a whole other modeling effort that's going to take a lot of um, development to understand where the seaweed grows and sinks in that scenario, but uh, it could potentially be a lot cheaper if you don't have to worry about the capital costs associated with offshore infrastructure. Um, so data on that and uh, a better understanding of those systems would be really interesting on the economic side. Finally, the costs associated with MRV here, um, I'm imagining you would need things like a lot of sensors, a lot of modeling, a lot of people spending time and effort uh, on, on doing monitoring and verification with this. So those costs were not explicitly included, but I think are going to be really important, especially if you do get the cost down to kind of that $100 to $200 per ton carbon range uh, that can kind of make or break this compared to other methods. So. Finally, I want to highlight, we worked with an organization called Carbon Plan to um, basically put our model online. So there's an interactive tool that you could use um, where you could play around with all the different cost inputs and zoom in regionally um, and figure out how much it costs to do seaweed carbon removal from our model in different regions. Um, and also for the, the kind of product side of things, you can play with the assumptions there about how much the products are worth. Um, and you can also see the inputs of seaweed yield and distance to port and depth and all those things. So this is a really cool um, way to try to make these results more accessible, um, and also I sometimes like go on and use it if I'm if I don't remember, you know, what the costs were in a certain region. It's a really quick way to just go and, and see what they were on a smaller scale. So thank you so much for listening. I want to acknowledge my collaborators again, um, and also the the economic part of this research was recently published. Um, if you want to learn more about it there, and the biophysical part is coming out on Thursday. So read that if you're interested. Um, and finally, I want to also acknowledge the, the folks at Carbon Plan who helped us make the web tool. Um, there's also an explainer article that goes with it if you want to check it out. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for your time. I think we have time for a question. Hi. Really cool talk. I think interdisciplinary science, like combining economics and the science, is really important. So I'll say this quickly. Um, have you considered any synergy with offshore structures like wind development? 
Yeah, that's a great question. We didn't consider that explicitly in this study, but that's, I think, a great way to potentially reduce those costs associated with offshore uh, infrastructure. Yeah, so I'm curious to see if there are any studies that have looked at that specifically, but that's, that's a great idea. So, yeah, thanks. All right, great talk. Thank you, Julianne. Uh, so in keeping with the theme of uh, uncertainties and uh, economics and costs, uh, we have David Emerson to talk about the uh, cost model of iron fertilization. Um, thanks very much, Tim, and the organizers for inviting me. Um, so this is a project that we've got some modest support from the Grantham Foundation to do a cost model for iron fertilization. So we started a little study group at Bigelow, Ben Twining and Steve Archer, as I'm sure many of you know, and uh, Alex Michaud, who's a research scientist who works with me, and Laura Sofen, who's a postdoc with Ben. Um, so I'm going to jump in with three admissions. Uh, first, this is my first OCB meeting. Um, if I'm not an oceanographer, I've learned a lot here. A lot of my colleagues at Bigelow rave about this meeting, and I can understand why. It's, I've learned a lot. It's really been fascinating. It's a great group. Um, I'm not an economist. Uh, what I am is a microbiologist, and so I thought I'd do one introductory slide here of how I got into this of, of microbes and iron, because my lab's been studying uh, these iron, particularly iron oxidizing microbial organisms for a long time. Um, and we worked in the deep ocean at, at hydrothermal vents. We've currently been doing some work in coastal sediments, but a lot of our work has been terrestrial. And this is a picture taken a couple of years ago up in the Arctic um, where we've been looking at iron cycling in the tundra. And what you're seeing here, um, uh, I'll get the old pointer out here. Um, so we discovered this trench uh, next to an Arctic river here. Uh, it's about a meter wide, a meter deep, about five meters long. Temperature in there is about two degrees C, uh, almost no measurable oxygen, about two or three micromolar iron. And within about five or six weeks, we watched this trench fill up with all this filamentous material, which is these iron oxidizing bacteria, which are shown in the micrograph. If you look closely at this, you see this sort of gauzy material that's covering all the plant roots and expanding out into this water channel, which is moving very slowly. Under a microscope, you see all these filamentous iron oxides that the bacteria are producing. You actually don't see many cells because they're all associated with these iron particles. A, a epifluorescent image here shows the cells staying green. Some of them form these tubular structures, other types of structures. They have a, a basic problem that they encapsulate themselves with the product of their uh, growth, which is an iron oxide or precipitate. And so they have to figure out ways avoid that encapsulation, and so they produce all these really filamentous uh, structures. We've been studying the ecology and physiology of these organisms for quite a while, and what we know is that these are sort of nanoparticulate iron materials, um, and we, can't, we can culture these in the lab, but we don't, uh, they're a bit challenging to work with, but we have figured out sort of the, that this very hydrate that they produce is very stable. Uh, it's got organic components to it. So how does this relate to uh, iron fertilization? Well, I was watching a, a, a seminar a few years ago by a colleague um, talking about how iron gets delivered to the ocean. Um, and this is a NASA simulation here of dust coming off the Sahara Desert, uh, depositing iron in the Atlantic. The iron, Atlantic is certainly not iron limited in this region because of all the uh, iron that precipitates out with the dust. And I've been thinking about We've been thinking about these irons, this biogenic iron and different aspects of it, including its role in Mars, but that's another story. Um, and thought, well, we knew we can, because it's nanocrystal and you can make really fine powder of it. I, well, maybe if you put this stuff up in the atmosphere, it would blow across the ocean. And because it's poorly crystalline, it's more bioavailable. It's certainly much more bioavailable than the iron that's coming out of this dust. Um, and so that got me thinking about OIF. And just to introduce you to OIF, I put up this Tom Tolles cartoon here. I'll point out this is from 1990. Uh, probably many of you don't know that Tom Tolles was a political cartoonist for the Washington Post for a long time. But this uh, was a take here that says, you know, we'll dump iron in the ocean. Uh, global warming is the greatest manipulation we've ever seen, but we can top that. Um, and this might be a quote, this is a quote from, I mean, this is a quip from John Martin, give me a ton of, give me a half a ton of uh, iron and a tanker and I'll give you another ice age. And I, 
possible he said this right here. I'm not sure. I know it was at a meeting at Woods Hole that he made this uh, comment. Um, that, you know, he, this was, I think, at least half joking. But anyway, uh, it, it sort of got people thinking about the, the potential for doing OIF. Um, and, and then uh, cheap, fast, easy, and looks promising. This is the first George Bush. Uh, and that, you know, actually, maybe one of the most important lessons from OIS is, is what happened following that, because it's actually, I mean, John Martin's work was really instrumental in understanding iron limitation, and it got people to go and doing these experiments, um, adding iron, showing that iron really was limiting in at least a third of the world's oceans, um, and then trying to measure export. And it was clear that from the, the experiments that were done in the 90s and early 2000s that iron was limiting, how much export was actually occurring was been a bit more ambiguous. Um, and what happened because of cheap, fast, and easy is that commercial interests became interested in this and um, started to propose actually going out and doing this on commercial scale. And the oceanographic community, I think, was one, some of the main people that really pushed back on this. And there's been some rogue uh, efforts at doing this that really shut down the whole field for quite a while. But I think, you know, it's time to to reconsider, and I think um, Ken Boosler's um, been uh, um, helping with a group that's been reconsidering sort of the science behind this, and I think it's, it's, it needs to be part of our the potential toolbox for this area, so exciting to see some considerations. Um, so why a cost model? It's a way to account for all the activities that are associated with a with an approach and compare between different CDR approaches with using a con common metric, which in this case is dollars. And I think it's also, I mean, one of our primary reasons for doing this was to, to sort of understand uncertainty and to put it in these dollar amounts um, and quantify that. And it's also useful for comparing um, different approaches, um, and w even within the iron fertilization area. Of, of, in our case, we're going to compare aerial and ship-based um, delivery mechanisms. Um, and then I think it actually really helps you to sort of specify and come up with a sort of the, some of the logistical aspects of a project. So what are the elements of this model? Um, so the goals, I mean, it's sort of an area that's on a fertilization, the iron concentration you need to add, how available that iron is, the bloom length, the stimulation of net primary productivity, um, and then the total net carbon production in terms of carbon per year. And in terms of the sequestration, it's uh, export efficiency, total carbon exported, CO2 ventilation, and then you're accounting for these negative offsets. So in this case, is nitrous oxide production, because it's pretty well established that if you did this on a large scale, you could generate nitrous oxide, a potent greenhouse gas. How much of that is that going to offset any CO2 you would take up? And then nutrient stealing, which is a concept that if you did iron fertilization for a number of years, you'd also be drawing down nitrogen and phosphorus um, as that water bodies get distributed around the world, up that you're going to increase the amount of nitrogen limitation, phosphorus limitation, which is ultimately going to feed back in a, in a negative way. Um, and then there's the process offsets, which are uh, the production of iron that you would use, the reagent that you would use, and then the delivery um, and then the verification, uh, which is really important, and sort of the amount of primary production, CO2 clustration, and coupled to that is the environmental monitoring of these changes in pH, oxygen depletion, toxin production, and community shifts. And I should point out that you know, we were working on this and um, came across this paper by Daniel Harrison from 2013, who had actually developed a model similar, and we sort of built off of his model um, in developing this, but ultimately, you're coming back to this sort of total amount of iron added in tons uh, per year. There's a cost associated with that that you can calculate, and then you can translate that into the number of tons of iron that gets sequestered. Um, and uh, it's a bit embarrassing in front of this crowd to present a, an embarrassingly simple model. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I'm not a model or I'm an experimentalist. I'm not an economist, as I already said. But anyway, the, the three major elements of this model are really the carbon sequestered, um, which is just a function of the 
of the carbon exported times that fraction that's lost to environmental, to, to ventilation or remineralization. And then there's a net carbon removal, which is taking that, um, that, that sequestered component and subtracting from that the amount that the offsets due to nitrous, oxygen, nitrous oxide production, as well as the estimated equivalence of CO2 for both processing and delivery and verification. Um, and then converting that all to a, to a dollar amount by simply taking you know, the cost of the reagents um, and, and taking into account the, those costs for verification um, and just dividing that by the amount of carbon you remove. And there's some other elements we have in this model as well, but, but these are sort of the central ones. Um, and so some of the assumptions of which, I mean, it's all assumptions, but <laughs> somebody who's an experimentalist, this is, it's kind of fun, actually. Um, <laughs> but uh, so the major assumptions here, we decided we should do this at deployment scale, so it's not a research scale. Um, so 1% of the Southern Ocean was what we picked, 100, 200,000 square kilometers. We just, um, if you're going to do this on research scale, obviously it would be much smaller, and there would be a cost associated with that. Um, but we assumed a uniform delivery uh, along a lot land grid, um, delivery via ship or plane. I'll talk a bit more about that. And then the costs we didn't consider were um, R&D costs. Uh, we didn't consider fixed costs for example, of redeployable remote sensors. Um, and it doesn't take into account any personnel or overhead costs or anything. All the costs are basically day rates for ships or planes. And really important to point, this is not a business model, right? I mean, <laughs> um, it's very much just a, a, a cost estimate to, to, to sort of understand some of these the effects of some of these different parameters, these oceanographic parameters, really. Um, so just again, the, the scenario here um, is to do a, a grid um, for aircraft. Uh, we projected, you know, 30. So, we, so we, we sort of set it up to compare as directly as possible we could ships versus planes. Um, so we had three aircrafts doing it over 10 days. And the ships, we had six ships um, working also for 10 days. So there would be a 10-day delivery period. Um, and we estimated that to get to our iron concentration, I'll talk about that in a second, but it was around 600 tons of iron. And, um, and we would do this three times over the course of the growing season. So there'd be three 10-day applications. Uh, and then for the oceanographic parameters um, that were in the, that we sort of, we actually, can, you can vary any of these, but the ones that we chose to vary for the model for this, exercise where the iron solubility, which I think of as bioavailability, um, which can be anywhere from um, you know, only 10% available up to about 75% of the iron being available. Uh, and then the stimulation of the net primary production. Um, and these are taken you know, some, from some of the experiments that have been done. Um, export efficiency, uh, 5 to 10 to 15%. So we have an intermediate best and worst case here. And then the percent of CO2 released through this ventilation process, again, we have a range here from 65 to 85%. And then nitrous oxide um, production, again, this was sort of based on some models and things like that, but uh, some percentages there for how much uh, nitrous oxide you potentially reduce and then converting that to CO2 equivalents. Uh, for the iron, we just set this at this one at, at six nanomoles per liter was our target, and a mixed layer depth of 60 meters, and as I said, 200,000 square kilometers. So in terms of the amount of carbon um, that gets exported, uh, obviously there's a very large range depending on your worst case versus your best case and in the, in the intermediate. But we come out with somewhere in the you know in a best case up to close to a million tons. Um, in a worst case, you know, you're, you're very low, under, under 10,000 tons, um, whereas in the intermediate case, we're at about 20, 250,000 tons. Um, so as, as you can see, a very large range, and obviously when you convert that range into costs, that comes out to a very large difference in costs. Uh, but I guess some of the, 
and comparing the planes to the ships, um, the planes come out a bit cheaper. Um, but you know, overall, there's a hundredfold differences here in between the best and worst case scenarios, anywhere from seven dollars dollars a ton. And verification plays a big role in this in terms of you can see the difference there when we include the verification costs um, just versus the, just the distribution of the iron. Um, as I said, the aerial costs are about 30 to 40 percent less. Um, I put an asterisk here uh, under the carbon because I think this is a, an interesting uh, and it's an interesting question for this group particularly, I guess. Because all our costs here are based on organic tons of carbon fixed. Um, and so to get the actual CO2, amount of CO2 you draw down, you would actually divide all these numbers by 3.7 if you were calculating on a CO2 basis versus an organic carbon basis. Um, but the uncertainty is if you take one ton of organic carbon out of the surface ocean and bury it deep, does that equilibrate to 3.7 tons pulled out of the atmosphere? Um, I'll let, I don't have an answer to that. <laughs> um, we looked at verification, and this is actually, I think this is a really important thing to, for people to spend more time. Well, we couldn't find much um, in terms of what the cost of verification would be. Uh, so we just sort of made a guess here. Um, we didn't really, I don't know what satellite time, I don't, you know, I don't even know if you pay for satellite time or not. But anyway, um, I do know you pay for ship time, and so we estimated that to, to, to uh, monitor, a, say, a 100,000 square patch of ocean, you'd, you could use two research class vessels, do two 70-day cruises each. You'd have 280 um, total ship days at $50,000 a day. Um, it didn't factor in the autonomous monitoring systems and things like that, but that ship-based Monitoring would allow you to measure carbon export, water column chemistry, the changes in the community, as well as the bloom development. Um, so I'm going to almost done here with a summary of sort of the schematic um, that I've put together. Um, and so these these boxes here are colored because we're talking. Well, we, this was part of our paper anyway, but this is. Um, uh, because we're talking about uncertainty, color coded these by what I would, what I call the scales of uncertainty, and I think there's a lot of debate about some of these. Um, but in terms of the process, I think you know the producing iron and processing it, you know, we can estimate those pretty well. Um, the iron delivery mechanism, you can estimate ship-based delivery pretty well. Uh, airplane air, aerial delivery, um, we certainly have estimates from. Things like fire suppressing chemicals, and agricultural chemical dispersal by aircraft that gives you some kind of, but you'd need to develop a whole system for actually doing iron um, that would be unique. Um, so that's a bit of an uncertainty there. In terms of the impact, I think it's well established that if you add iron to a nutrient limited, iron limited area, you get a significant amount of primary productivity stimulation. Um, in terms of the amount of carbon export, um, I mean, I think in terms of being able to actually just measure export, you know, using sediment traps and things like that is, is reasonably, uh, it's pretty good. Um, maybe the overall export, it, it becomes more difficult. And then the permanence, uh, I, my reading of the literature is that permanence is quite a difficult thing um, to establish. Um, and then in terms of the negative offsets, uh, you know, the, the nitrous oxide production, clearly that's a major offset if it's produced. It's not, I mean, there's not a lot of evidence one way or the other about that. Um, and then the nutrient stealing, the things I put crossed out here, we actually didn't put in the model and we chose not to put nutrient stealing in just because um, it's pretty far removed both spatially and temporally from anything that you would actually do and be able to measure. Um, as well as there not actually being empirical evidence, it's all modeling based, which is fine. And it's really important to consider in the long term. But for, our, for the sake of this model, we chose not to put it in. And then the CO2 ventilation, which relates, reflects on the permanence is also, I think, quite, uh, quite uncertain. And then there's also, we didn't talk about methane production, but that's another potential greenhouse gas you can produce uh, when you lower the oxygen, um, deplete the oxygen 
which you certainly will do. If this is successful, you are going to deplete oxygen to a certain extent in the deeper ocean. Um, so that could lead to methane production. I didn't talk at all about positive offsets, and there are potentially some. Um, increased fisheries, and I know that whales are not fish, um, but uh, there's a really interesting idea about this whale pump. Uh, um, I encourage people to look at Matt Savoca and others to put forward in the Southern Ocean um, that, that feeds back to iron. There's also DMS production, um, which is, could lead to increases in albedo and reduce um, uh, uh, re increased Earth's re reflectance. And then uh, there's also some interesting ideas that if you add iron to the atmosphere, uh, it reacts with, with methane and, uh, and breaks down methane photochemically. And then the ecosystem change, I think, is well established that there's going to be significant changes in the ecosystem in terms of the community. Uh, oxygen depletion, if it works well, probably will be an issue. Uh, toxin production is something people talk a lot about, but there's no evidence for it um, with these OIF experiments that have been done. So I'll just finish up with these sort of four, four, four key points. Um, that OIF can be very cost effective. I mean, the, the, the dollar values are less than any other CDR method out there if everything works well. Um, but on the other hand, if the worst case scenario is then it becomes very cost ineffective. We think that aerial delivery should be uh, looked at as a more cost effective method. Uh, the verification environmental monitoring is very significant um, and processing costs are relatively small actually for OIF compared to other uh, CDR methods. But then key uncertainties are I think you know this ventilation remineralization question is important and as I said the cost can vary by a thousand percent. Um, depending on the outcomes. And then the positive, pos positive offsets we haven't really considered. And then the unintended nutrient cons nutrient robbing, stealing. But I'll, I'll, and I'll end with this last point, is, which is, I think, really important. In a business as usual scenario, um, would global IF, OIF, assuming it could do even one or two gigatons a year, would it make any difference at all? Right? Probably not. <laughs> So I'll end on that happy note. All right, so thanks to all the speakers uh, uh, so far. And you all will take a break, gather your thoughts, and come back for a few more talks. Bring your burning questions uh, and, and non-burning questions for the uh, panel discussion. Our next speaker uh, is going to be Matt Lon from NCAR and Seaworthy, and he's going to be talking about Seaworthy, building the tools needed to ensure safe and effective ozone-based carbon dioxide removal. I can read this line. All right. <laughs> Welcome, Matt. Okay. Thanks, Tim. Uh, I just want to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak. Um, I'm going to talk today about this new initiative that I'm building um, uh, in collaboration with my colleagues David Ho and Alicia Karspeck. Uh, in the audience here, uh, called Seaworthy. Um, the basis for, uh, for this talk, really, and, and our objectives with Seaworthy are encapsulated to an extent here in this plot, which shows uh, the amount of uh, carbon removal needed by 2050 and then by the end of the century um, to, be, to remain consistent with the net zero targets uh, that are consistent with the two degree C warming criterion. And I've added notes here that by 2050, we approximately have to double the magnitude of the current ocean sink, and that by 2100, the amount of CDR operating needs to be about equivalent to, to two times the ocean sink. So these are really big numbers on a planetary scale of carbon removal and present something of a daunting challenge. Um, this same paper uh, articulates the, the growth rate uh, in deployment of CDR necessary to achieve these targets, and the implication is that we need about a 6% per year growth. And so right now, the moment is uh, we, we're, we're looking at this future, and the, the requirement is to really think about setting the trajectory to achieve these kinds of gigaton scale uh, removal rates. Um, there's a lot of capital flowing into this space, and I've um, illustrated here a number of the companies that um, we've connected with through Seaworthy, as well as um, some really interesting market shaping mechanisms. Frontier is a nearly billion dollar pre purchase. A fund that is trying to stimulate R&D 
by using models that have been adapted from public health, global health initiatives, um, incentivizing research and development in carbon removal technologies by purchasing offsets. Um, and you've heard a, a few talks uh, today already from Isometric. So there's an ecosystem of actors beginning to become established in this space. But when we look at this space um, uh, related to, to marine CDR, what we see is this missing gap that there's really uh, a requirement for research infrastructure and knowledge generation to fill this quantification, um, uh, this, this quantification gap in the value chain. And you know, we've been thinking about this for, for a while, and here's a picture from this workshop that was held in, uh, in, sep in September of last year at, at University of Rhode Island. And I found this to be a really inspiring event because you know, I've been coming to the OCB meetings uh, since the early 2000s when I was a graduate student. I considered this my, my community. I've learned so much uh, about the ocean system and about ocean biogeochemistry at the OCB workshops. And I felt sitting in this room with all the people from this scientific community and intermingled, intermingled were people from private companies. And there was this real tension that was developing where, where people uh, from these companies you know, were engaged in trying to move fast and trying to build, build a business model predicated on carbon removal. And people in the research community, some, 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 some people were new to the topic and others had, had been thinking about it for a while. But there was just this real sense of momentum that developed um, in this sort of diversification of our community and engagement with the private sector. I, and I, I personally found that really inspiring. Um, following that meeting, um, Alicia and I were sitting in a park in, in Boulder and we're talking about how we could build an institution that would address some of this, the, the issues associated with quantification. And we came across this model of a focused research organization. And a focused research organization is sort of a new type of, of institution that is not a, not a private company, um, it's not a government lab, and it's not an academic enterprise, but it sits kind of at the nexus of these things. And it has the following attributes, led by a full-time founding team. Um, it's a large team of engineering heavy uh, 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 actors. Um, it's focused on producing high impact public goods, okay, so it's not for profit. Um, and it's scoped as a finite duration project explicitly so as to avoid the institutional inertia that develops as institutions grow in age. And then finally, the objective of an FRO is to build public infrastructure and deliver a capacity into the public domain. So the three of us uh, got together after that meeting and decided that we were gonna write a proposal and uh, seek funding to become an FRO focused on uh, verification of marine carbon dioxide research. Um, and that led to the inception of, uh, of Seaworthy. So we are not yet an FRO, we're in a seedling phase. We've um, garnered uh, funding from a collection of, of funders um, that are listed on the bottom of this, of this slide. We're being currently incubated by Convergent Research, which, which is a member of the Schmidt Futures uh, Philanthropic Network. And here is our mission, um, to build software to support multi-scale oceanographic modeling and data assimilation to quantify the efficacy and ecological impacts of ocean-based CDR. Okay, so in this space, there's a collection of challenges that we need to confront. And I've, I've listed it here, and you've, you've heard about many of these already from, from speakers in this session. So the first thing is that the baselines of, um, against which we need to, to compare uh, fluxes to establish additionality are complex. I'll say more about that in, in the next few slides. Um, the signals associated with marine CDR manifest over very large spatiotemporal scales, and the signal-to-noise ratios are, are unfavorable. Um, and then, you know, if we're going to use models, there's, uh, there's questions about our, our model skill. And finally, we have things that we don't know about the ocean system, unknown unknowns. So just to illustrate some of these dynamics, provide a little bit more of an in, in, intuitive sense, here's a simulation um, or, or uh, an animation from a simulation that I conducted at NCAR uh, showing the air-sea flux field. This is a global one-tenth of a degree eddy resolving integration. It's a very expensive calculation. 
in, in the um, ocean general circulation model, we've embedded representation of the, up, of, of, the, of the ocean ecosystem and the biogeochemical cycles mediating carbon fluxes. And what you can see in this field is um, the imprint of variability that manifests as a function of mesoscale eddy dynamics uh, up to synoptic atmospheric systems, the wind that mediates the gas transfer velocity. You can see the large scale gradients associated with the ocean overturning circulation. So there's outgassing at the equator and uptake driven by cooling and high, um, high productivity waters at high latitudes. Um, and this field is dual sign. So the implication is that we are not, when we are doing CDR, we are not necessarily looking for a net for, for, for gross fluxes that are into the ocean, but rather if we're operating a CDR um, in a region that it has net, gas, net outgassing, it's a reduction in that outgassing. Or if we're operating in a region where the net flux is already negative, it's an enhancement in that negative flux. So this baseline is really critical and a really complicated, highly variable field. Second thing relates to both spatiotemporal scales. So this is an animation from a 124th degree um, model. This is a region in the equatorial Pacific. Um, and what we've done is just release a passive dye tracer to illustrate some of the dynamics here. And so what you can see on the bottom and uh, Y axis is just um, some of the, the spatial scales. Looks like the movie's having trouble updating. But this dye tracer is um, being distributed in this equatorial or you know, off equatorial flow over these very large distances um, in space and time. There's a, there's a time scale um, in the upper corner. So the, the, the implication here is that a, a perturbation applied locally will not remain in that local area, but require um, very, you know, a very large observing network to capture um, if, if, we aim, if we're able to capture that at all in, in the context of observation. So that movie is slightly misleading because what, what I did to provide uh, a, a clear visualization there was plotted on a log scale or something like a log scale. And in fact, as we've seen from other speakers today, you know, the picture on the left is a, is a nice picture to visualize this signal, but what we're really gonna be faced with is something more akin to what's on the right. We're, we're, trying to be, we're gonna be trying to capture very large signals relative to a large background field. And so this signal to noise ratio is a problematic feature. So that leads us to the necessity to use numerical models um, to quantify ocean CDR. And what we, what, what we envision at Seaworthy is to basically assemble kind of bespoke systems that address this problem and provide easy to use tool, tool chains so that you can go out and do CDR experiments and then have decision support systems to support the design and quantification of those experiments. And what I've illustrated in this uh, flow chart here is sort of the layout of that type of modeling system. So at the core is an ocean general circulation model, and it's coupled to uh, biogeochemical models and representations of uh, ocean ecosystems or tracer processes. In some cases, we'll, be, uh, we'll, we'll need to build representations of the CDR processes that are, that are um, that are, that are being invoked in, in the ocean. And um, integrating that model um, in a free running mode or coupling it with data assimilative uh, techniques to ensure appropriate uh, validation and uh, constraints from observational data. Um, a key thing in this diagram here is that, you know, we encapsulate these layers as sort of low level layers behind um, interface tools that build applications suitable for uh, commercial, commercial use. So this, it, this concept of, of building numerical modeling infrastructure, software infrastructure, is informed by um, years of, of working in the space of Earth system model development. And one of our central motivating um, uh, premises here is this idea that communities of practice can establish organically around tools that are easy to use. And that the tools themselves then provide a forum to establish consensus. So the thing we're really interested in here is thinking about building a network 
uh, of researchers who are engaging in the development of seaworthy tools and engaging in the deployment of those tools towards MCDR applications and providing that as a basically a forum for the, for the scientific conversation that needs to evolve around establishing consensus and pass forward for, for MRV. We can sort of put some definitions about what we think high quality MRV should look like, and we've listed some of those here. So specifically, we're operating in a space that is distinct, I think, from our typical academic sphere in that we are trying to confront the climate crisis and build systems and build MRV systems that are good enough. We're, we want to ensure that net carbon removal is indeed occurring and that we're going to quantify uncertainty in that removal. Um, those systems need to be sufficiently fast and efficient to deploy. Um, the, the, effect, the, 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 the financial impact of MRV cannot be debilitatingly expensive. Um, the system should treat pro, um, the, the range of technologies that present, present as viable M, uh, MCDR pathways. Um, we need to have clear assessments of ecological safety, and so a component of these tools needs to be able to address ecosystem impact assessment. And then finally, and, and perhaps you know, this is a nuanced point, but what we aim to do initially here is present prototypes and build end-to-end -end prototypes that present targets for iterative refinement. We're not going to solve all the long-standing questions related to the ocean carbon cycle in the next couple of years, in the next five to seven years, but rather what we can do is establish frameworks that, are, that, 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 that can evolve with the, the bleeding edge of science and ensure that that bleeding edge of science is retained in the market mechanisms for MRV. Finally, just a couple words on uncertainty here. Um, so in the climate literature, there's this sort of uh, um, taxonomy of uncertainty, and um, there's been um, many analyses that sort of perform an uncertainty budget like the graph on the right here illustrates. Um, this is broken down into chaotic uncertainty or uncertainty that's intrinsic in the chaotic dynamics of the climate system in orange. Uh, scenario uncertainty, you know, if we want to make a projection out in the future, it's contingent upon the emissions scenario. And so that entails uncertainty about what people will do. And then epistemic risk or epistemic uncertainty is basically the structural uncertainty embedded in the, in the fact that our models of that system are imperfect. We have a very analogous situation, I think, in the context of MRV, where uncertainty, um, you know, we're still stuck with, with chaotic uncertainty and that the ocean is a turbulent uh, fluid, um, for example, and uh, so we can't track, we can't predict its dynamics exactly beyond some chaotic limit threshold. We have operational uncertainty, so understanding what the intervention that we did um, in the ocean was and how much, how much alkalinity we put in, for example. Um, we're still stuck with this epistemic uncertainty, the fact that we have imperfect knowledge of the system. And then finally, there's measurement uncertainty associated with our capacity to measure at a level of precision and deploy sampling technology over, over a sufficiently dense uh, observational array. It's worth pointing out that this approach predicated on using numerical models presents some risk. So anytime you want to improve a model in terms of its complexity or process representation or increase the resolution or the extent of a physical domain or run more ensembles so that you can improve your assessment of the statistics of the, of the system, you increase the computational cost and you increase the data. And that is a real, that presents a real uh, constraint on our ability to advance science and to advance uh, effective frameworks for MRV. So embedded in our research plan is a requirement to kind of figure out how to evade that computational constraint. So just for the last few minutes here, I'm going to present just a few, uh, a few sort of breadcrumbs uh, uh, along a trail that we're exploring to um, prototype a framework for doing that uh, relevant to ocean alkalinity enhancement and direct ocean removal. So just quickly, we've seen this in the previous talks. When you add alkalinity to the ocean, you reduce the surface ocean PCO2. And so if you start on a, in, a, in a phase space delineated by DIC and alkalinity on some PCO2 line, you can add alkalinity, there's a reduction in PCO2, and then gas exchange returns the, uh, that, that 
uh, replenishes that carbon deficit and returns PCO2 to its original value. There is a thermodynamic efficiency that ranges across the ocean from about 0.7 to about 0.9, and that's contingent upon the DIC alkalinity ratio. So we can expect efficiencies, um, a maximum efficiency for OAE um, in that range. Um, so, okay, so we add alkalinity. The thing that we need to have happen for CDR to have taken place is that the DIC or the PCO2 deficit needs to be replenished. And so the parcel of water that to which alkalinity has been added must be exposed to the atmosphere for a sufficiently long amount of time for that deficit to have been replenished. And I think Jing's talk uh, earlier in the session illustrated this quite nicely. Um, there's a potential, depending on the alkalinity source, for all sorts of uh, ecological effects. If we're using crushed rock with ancillary constituents, that potential is greater than if we're using something like an electrochemical technique. But if we just take those out of the picture for the moment, the system really boils down to this transport and gas exchange problem. So one of the things that we've started to poke at um, over the past couple months is to conduct a screening analysis of uh, the efficiency of alkalinity uh, addition and how it varies at basin scales. And this is work that um, has done, been done by Meng Yang Zhao. At, uh, he's a graduate student working with us at NCAR. I think I have another two minutes, right? One minute, okay. <laughs> so what we've done in each of these regions is added an impulse um, function of alkalinity and integrated the model with just that impulse for just that region for 15 years to develop a characteristic response curve for that region. And here's a sample of these curves normalized to the amount of alkalinity that we added into the model. They're colored by latitude, and so you can see that there's a range of different um, efficiencies. Um, that range is larger, for instance, if the release happens in winter than if it happens in summer. And then with, because we've done this for each region individually, we can make maps uh, that look like this one that show the distribution of ocean or the distribution of a, the efficiency of ocean alkalinity enhancement. So a map like this pre presents as uh, some effective guidance about where you might want to deploy these technologies. But moreover, we can use these kind of characteristic curves if done with sufficiently high resolution model and validated um, for you know a range of different assumptions. We can use these curves as sort of the convolution and integral a kernel for a convolution integral that can be used as an effective framework for MRV. And so this presents as, you know, it doesn't take computation out of, of the picture, but presents a, a, a way to sort of reduce a lot of the computational complexity um, for a given site and uh, temporal sequence of alkalinity addition. So over the next um, uh, several years, our intention is to build this system and to deploy it in the context of field trials, as well as in places where observations are rich, um, basically to continue to improve the model. We can use the models to help design field trials and help design observational arrays, and then use those observations to ensure that there are no, no unknown unknowns, and that to the extent process representations are deficient, we can address those through, through development. Okay, finally, I just want to step back and just note that what we're up against right now as a society is this pivotal moment where what we do over the next 10 years or so will set the trajectory for the remainder of the century. And really what our, our goals are for Seaworthy is to evade sort of business as usual. We're really seeking to establish a disruptive organization that can affect change and be community oriented in our approach. And with that, I'm done. Thanks. Thank you very much, Matt, uh, for the nice talk. I heard the long version of that talk a week ago. <laughs> it was good, too. Um, so uh, we'll move on to some lightning speakers now. Hello, everyone. My name is Yi Liu, and I'm a PhD student at University of California, Irvine. And today I'm going to talk about my research, uh, some of my recent work about the global ocean overturning circulation and the efficacy of some CDR strategies. 
So most of my uh, most of my study only focusing on the CDR strategies, which we try to sequester carbon in the deep ocean. And um, the efficiency of the CDR is highly dependent on the carbon, uh, the sequestration time and ventilation fraction of carbon from the ocean back into the atmosphere. And this is highly dependent on the state of the ocean overturning circulation. However, most of the recent work focuses uh, assume that the ocean circulation will not change, at, uh, change with time, even in the context of climate change. So here we are trying to see like the impact of changing circulation in the context of climate change on the efficiency, uh, efficiency of CDR strategies. So before I jump into my results, first we look into the changes of global ocean overtaining circulation. See the figure in the left-hand side? Uh, I show the global overturning circulation both for the upper cell and the abyssal cell. So in the top, uh, in the top panel, we show the changes of AMOC, which is the upper cell overturning circulation from the pre-industrial to the year 2300 under the basis as usual warming scenario. So, all, uh, so the figure here actually includes all the available CMAP6 files, CMAP6 models to quantify the changes of the circulation. And we see in the upper panel, there is a strong decline of the global overtime circulation from uh, around like 21st century and a, uh, and a gradually slows down and stabilizes after year 2200. And see the bottom here is actually the basal overtime circulation, which uh, also gradually slows down as climate warms, but finally it closes to uh, fully shuts down. So we are interested in how the changes of this over tenure circulation on the efficiency of some CDR strategies. Uh, so this figure, uh, this figure we show, we, we, we try to inject some tracers at different depths of the ocean and quantify the possible uh, CDR efficiencies uh, based on both the constant circulation assumption, also the changing circulation uh, uh, in the context of climate change. And we see the, all the solid line here. The solid line here shows the uh, CDR efficiency under more realistic ocean circulation, which means we allow the ocean circulation changing with climate. But we see the dash line here is uh, we suppose the ocean circulation is constant, which means we do, not, it, uh, we do not allow it to change with time. So the difference between the solid line and the dash line actually shows the impact of changing circulation on the CDR efficiencies. And we see the different colors here means we are interested in the different depths that we are sequestering carbon in the ocean. So we uh, did some idealized experiment. We injected, we injected tracers at different depths from 500 meter, 1,000 meter to 2,000 meter. See the impact of uh, circulation slowdown on the CDR efficiencies. And uh, from this figure, we see that if our interest is just trying to sequester carbon below the depth of uh, 500 meters, we see that after, two, after 200 years, there are only like around 20% of carbon can still stay in the ocean before it leasing back to atmosphere. And the, ch the difference between the constant circulation and the changing circulation is around like 4%. It increases the efficiency of CDR from 18% to 22% at the year of 200, um, at the time of 200 years after we inject the tracers. But if our focus is around like 1,000 meter, we can see there is a large, uh, a large increase of the CDR efficiency from 42% to 51%. And if we are more ambitious, we can increase the CDR efficiency from 70% to 77% here. So I give a, short, a quick summary. First, we need to consider the changes of global ocean overtime circulation when we quantify the efficiency of CDR strategies. And the second thing is we've developed a framework to quantify the impact of ocean overtime circulation slowdown on the efficiency of CDR strategies. So this framework can work both for the global scale and the local scale. If you are interested, you can come to my poster tomorrow. We can dis discuss about more details. Thanks. Jamie.
like Victoria said, um, I gave myself a talk. Um, and why not? But really, it's to show off the great work of my students and postdoc, um, Sarah Nickford, who is at SOLAS this week, so can't be here. Um, and my name is Jamie Palter, and I'm at the University of Rhode Island. And I'm going to combine a few ideas to talk about the possible contributions of uncrewed surface vehicles to um, measuring CDR strategies in the ocean. And so I've been... This, is this There we go. Okay. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay. That's okay. My, so, I'll, t I'll let me tell you a story. <laughs> sail, sail drones. Just picture them, these orange sailboats, wind-powered, solar-powered. I've been using them um, in the Gulf Stream region to measure CO2 using the innovations from NOAA's PMEL, which has an ASB CO2 sensor that measures uh, carbon in the ocean atmosphere at high precision. And we had up to five sail drones out in the Gulf Stream um, in the winter of 21-22. Um, very challenging. Uh, Observational. So I can just keep going. Why not? Um, I don't. I don't. I don't need the visual. But just, just picture it. Um, <laughs> um, it's a very challenging observational environment. But um, the sail drones are very capable. Um, we sailed three of them out from um, Rhode Island and had them circle the OOI moorings as a pioneer array. And the visual that you would see is that the three sail drones just measure the same ocean PCO2 really nicely. They have um, a nominal precision of two mic microatmospheres, and I would say that that's pretty, pretty right on for what we saw, you know, in that range at least. And so if we can use those to fill gaps in ocean observing, then um, there we go. There's Sarah. And so this is um, the, the pathways that the sail drones uh, took for leaving from Rhode Island and, and going through the North Atlantic. And the, the gray colors in the background um, are the entirety of, of ocean observing in winter for CO2. So you can see like the tangle of colored points um, in the middle, that's a single winter, and we collected as many, probably more, CO2 observations in that huge block of ocean in a pretty well-observed part of the North Atlantic in that single winter with these sail drones as had been in the entirety of ocean history for the winter time. This is just winter time data, but January, February, March. Um, and so uh, we sailed around, let's see, you heard. I'm scared. What do I <laughs> there we go. Okay, so we sailed around the OI moorings and the um, CO2 trace from all three sail drones plus the OOI shown in those black symbols, this is from Sarah's work, um, are all pretty spot on. And some of these variances, like those dips, that's true variability. We could see an ocean eddy in the sea surface temperature image. So we, we, that's real. Um, Okay, so how can we apply this to CDR? Now I'm going to show off about um, my former postdoc, Lynn Mew, who um, is here and has a great poster on re uh, related work from Cell Drone, um, but I thought I would show this. Um, did a hypothetical alkalinity addition to the Amazon, just a thought experiment, to, um, but with high level of expertise of what would happen if we increased alkalinity in the Amazon river plume just a little, just within, just barely detectable beyond background variability to see, say like if we had a field trial that was trying to do the least harm but still be detectable. And so on the left-hand side is the PCO2 that he calculated from the sea surface temperature PCO2 relationship where the sea, sea, sea surface salinity, sorry, PCO2 relationship and a satellite derived um, sea surface salinity. And on the right is the perturbation to that PCO2 um, with a 20 micromolar uh, addition of, t of TA, total alkalinity, in the Amazon River. And you can see that um, that in the most perturbed part of the plume um, with this, in this hypothetical, we have a PCO2 reduction of 25 micromolar. And so uh, sail drones, you know, transiting back and forth, finding the plume using a satellite image could monitor for that kind of perturbation. So if we were able to do ocean alkalinity enhancement, through riverine deployment, or even enhanced rock weathering, where bicarbonate solutes ended up in the river, that might be monitorable using autonomous 
um, platforms um, and, and the sensors that suites that have been developed. And so if you want to read more about that, oh no, I, don't, I wonder if that will keep you from t do it using the QR code, but his paper um, is, is out. And so please have a read or visit his poster. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Jamie. Uh, we're on time. The sale drones are awesome. Uh, so next up is uh, Ken Bistler. And I'm not going to touch the screen left it self destructs again. Go to press speaker. Ah. Hey. Stand over here. Thank you, everyone. Super excited to be here. I'm only going to have two slides. I really got an, I think, an easy job, but I don't think. We've uh, been talking to too many people about this group that formed about just over March 2022 called EXOIS. If you leave here and you can pronounce that, then you're already better off, E-X-O-I-S. And basically, <clears throat> you've heard, you saw the cartoon, there's a history in ocean iron, goes back 35 years to John Martin and his quip about the half a tanker of iron. But that kind of, that story got kind of pushed forward on the CDR and the uh, side and geoengineering faster than the science in many ways. The science that was done in several successful experiments showed that the ocean grows in many places limited by iron, a micronutrient, right? We did not take those experiments into the questions we're asking today, how can we affect atmospheric CO2 in a permanent, durable way with consequences that are acceptable relative to doing nothing. That was not the intent of those experiments. So kind of thinking about where we wanted to move forward, <clears throat> when I was on the uh, committee that looked at several methods for marine CDR and the academies, you know, they all have problems. They all have big questions. They all need good science. So I went back to the group that was working on Ocean Iron 20, 30 years ago and said, hey, should we get the band back together? Should we do more on this? And we formed this thing we're calling Exploring Ocean Iron Solutions. And Exploring is really in there because we don't have a solution. We don't have an answer, but right now we've gathered about <clears throat> 20, 30 institutions, uh, over 100 people. We meet once a month virtually. On the next slide, I'll show you what our next uh, meeting is. And we're going through all of the issues that you're talking about. What would be the durability if you were to perturb the ocean by adding in iron in terms of carbon sequestration? How big would that scale? What are these ecological impacts? What are the costs? And on the next slide, a bit about the ethical standards how would you do that? So <clears throat> we started in March. By November of last year, we had what we call a white paper. It's kind of like a science plan. There's a QR code that isn't covered. Uh, and oceaniron.org is a pretty easy URL to remember. We've got everything up there from who we are. Our funding has been from Schmidt Futures and from a group called Axios so far. But individuals have their own grants, right? We're an umbrella group. So far, we're not a funding group. But I, I like this approach. And, you know, if you think of most corporate models where they're getting venture capital, they have one scientist, they have five scientists. We have some 30 plus people who met a month ago at Moss Landing Marine Lab to plan that next generation iron experiment. So we're actually building on, I think, a community that has a lot of skills to address these questions that are going to be needed to move forward. And I will get to uh, this path forward. What does that look like? So that's my second slide. But before I do, I really think this first set of points when we got together, Margaret Leinen has played a big role as part of Exoist, and we really wanted to get back to the basic principles. We talked to some of the NGOs, Nature Conservancy, Ocean Conservancy, sorry, uh, and several groups, the Aspen Foundation, they've been looking at these, what would be the code of conduct of the guiding principles? And I think we really want to put these down, at least we did first. So why are we out to do this? And this really... We shouldn't be doing this if we can't show a collective benefit for humans in our environment. This is, we're not out to make a profit. That's our primary goal. We need clear lines of responsibility. What's been happening sometimes is that people go out, they're not getting the permission. They just do work. This is largely in the open ocean where it's largely unregulated, but I think we have to be doing it according to whatever standards exist. And right now, under the London Protocol, London Convention, there is a pathway forward for CDR, particularly iron research. 
Uh, we want open, open and cooperative research. You know, a lot of the company models have secrets they're trying to keep from you. We want to put out there what our plans are, what our data are, have ways to evaluate that, to assess that in iterative matters, and engage the public. We're not going to move forward if we don't have the public that understands the need for CDR, uh, basically why the oceans and why iron. So our path forward, we're going to have field studies that we're proposing. I like that term in red, MRV and EMRV. I was at the ocean, uh, this OCB workshop. There was a lot of discussion, but EMRV is all the environmental impacts, ecological impacts that go along with just counting carbon atoms. Most groups have co-opted MRV to really mean carbon only. I'm glad to see other groups considering more than that, but we want to have another term for it. If you're not doing MRV and EMRV, you're not really looking at all the consequences of what we're trying to do. So if you want to hear about what our path is, June 20th, 5 p.m., you can go on to our website. You can get invited to this forum, this monthly forum. And then the final bullet I'm announcing here, I've seen other groups are have new hires. We also have the ability now to hire a full-time position for two years to help launch Exos to the next level of field studies, modeling they're going to hear about, the iron bake-off, what form of iron to add, and really consider from the beginning the social and governance issues to make this move forward. So thank you very much. Thanks, Ken. Uh, next is Dennis McGovern-Kelly to talk about uh, observing system simulations. I think I said that. Well, thank you all very much for the opportunity to talk with you about a project that we hope to be spinning up starting this fall, doing observing system simulation experiments uh, for iron fertilization in three different high nutrient, low chlorophyll regions. Uh, we'll be doing this with two different earth system models, one from GFDL in collaboration with Charlie Stock and John Dunn, uh, and the uh, community earth system model uh, in collaboration with Matt Long and Kristen Crumhart. Uh, Gordon Zhang here at Hui is going to be setting up uh, high resolution subdomains of these earth system models in the little white boxes that you see uh, in the inset there. Uh, where they'll be sufficiently high resolution to, to represent the fronts and eddies that are so characteristic of these regions. The idea behind observing system simulation experiments is to essentially use the models as a representation of reality that can be subsampled in space and in time with various observing platforms, specified measurement error. So that winds up with a simulated data set that gives you a simulated data set, which you can then analyze for its statistics or make maps or whatever your diagnostics are going to be, which then you can compare with truth as defined by that model. Of course, the models are imperfect, so that's why truth is in, uh, is in quotes. But this is a means to quantitatively evaluate the uh, characteristics, the error characteristics of any given uh, sampling scheme. So uh, one of the trade-offs that we're going to be looking at and unfortunately, I don't think this animation is going to work, uh, but whether you deliver the iron in a big patch, as was uh, described earlier, or in a continuous source uh, from uh, a fixed location, and unfortunately, the animation didn't work. But let's talk about that uh, continuous release from a fixed point. And if you think about the plume of the response, which is that envelope of variability in all the fronts and eddies that, that Matt showed you, think about that green plume downstream of a, of a fixed point fertilization, you can think about it an observing network that would be required to actually measure the carbon sequestration. So consider an array of sediment traps oriented in the north-south direction. Uh, there is a whole set of design requirements. How, what's the spatial scale of the array? What's its horizontal, vertical, and temporal resolution? Uh, and how far afield do you have to go to um, measure this uh, additionality? So let's think about what the data might look like from one of these experiments. We haven't done them yet. Uh, a control simulation or the counterfactual is going to have all kinds of variability in it, from synoptic to seasonal to interannual to interdecadal variability, and so there are error bars around that counterfactual. Then presumably in the uh, fertilization experiment, we're going to see some increase in the carbon export, and so those green arrows represent that additionality. And of course, one's got to look at not just additionality, but durability. 
uh, and all these questions can be addressed within the model-based framework. Of course, the observing network is going to be more than just, oops, uh, here we go, is going to be more than just, uh, right, more than just sediment traps. <clears throat> One could imagine uh, lines of gliders uh, uh, sampling the downstream plume. You can imagine uh, arrays of bioargo floats deployed upstream so they can drift through and measure the various quantities. And again, a whole set of design parameters for these kinds of iron fertilization experiments that Ken spoke about. Then there's a whole set of analogous questions about the larger scale observing network that would be required if you're going to actually do this at scale, the big black boxes rather than the small little white boxes from the first figure. So these are, these are pretty um, humbling uh, thought experiments to conduct, numerical experiments to conduct. But really what I want to emphasize, and again, thanks for the ability to address you today in sort of in the, the spin-up phase of this project, we really would uh, welcome uh, your participation in any number of ways, including feedback on array designs, sensor networks, all those things, the new sail drone uh, that was just described by Jane is really, really exciting. Um, we also want to uh, encourage other modeling groups to participate in this enterprise. Uh, N equals two is, in terms of Earth system models, probably better than N equals one, uh, but really given all of the variability that we see in biogeochemical models and their treatment of iron, we hope to have a whole family of models uh, working on this problem. Lastly, since the bell just uh, went off, I want to just finish with a reflection on the challenge to the field of ocean science that this kind of science presents us with. Um, Matt, I think, used the term debilitatingly expensive uh, MRV. And the scale of the observing networks that we're talking about here with hundreds of sediment traps and lots of glider lines and YG chemical Argo floats floating through the region all the time this is a scale of ocean observing that we have not done as a field. Even with a very exciting ocean observatories network and all of those things, we're talking about a whole different scale of ocean observing that's going to be required to verify the intended consequences and also monitor for the unintended consequences, including ecosystem disruption and changing the productivity of the oceans, which are very, very serious things. We as a community, I think, really need to say what will be required in order to do that, if we're going to do it responsibly. So thank you for this opportunity to present. Hi, everyone. Patrick Rafter here again. Um, as Jamie said, you know, we're, we organized it, so um, we get to say who gets to give the lightning talks. Um, I'm the last one, so, you know, take a breath. We're about to get into the panel uh, in a second. Um, and this won't be too long. So I'm working with some friends, um, Ryan Green and Matas Hain at UC Santa Cruz. We, uh, Matas and I are co-advising Ryan. And what we're exploring is the um, potential or the utility for using um, seawater C13 alongside DIC alkalinity pH um, for quantifying, um, you know, additionality of atmospheric CO2 alongside um, Marine CDR. Um, we are isotope geochemists, we're, and, and so you might say, you know, well, that's what I, we expect you to do. Um, and uh, I would say you're right. Yeah, we're actually we're, we're big believers in seawater C13. And so just to show you a, a quick example of a, a quick test. So it's just a box model test of um, an ocean alkalinity enhancement. Um, we're showing DIC on the on the y-axis. So there's a, you can see it's flat. This box model was in, in equilibrium at first, and that point where it starts to rise up is the OAE experiment. The x-axis is time in units of years. Um, if you wanted uh, some details on the background of uh, sort of the setting for this or the uh, sort of our motivation here, I urge you to see the uh, Gene Lynch Stieglitz wrote a paper in 98, and we just sort of took that and ran with it. All right, so what other effects do we expect to find with this OAE um, test. So um, this is a change in pH. So this is actually the anomaly. And uh, so the units are here on the right side of the axis. Um, you see a, a, a increase in pH at first. And then as you start to draw down CO2, you end up with something like a 0 0.001 um, anomaly in pH, steady anomaly. Okay. Um, the nice thing about C13 is 
C13, if taking up atmospheric CO2, atmospheric CO2 is something like minus nine and lowering because of something that's called the Seuss effect. Burning of fossil fuels has, uh, uh, introduces a very low um, delta C13 to the atmosphere. And so what we're arguing is that um, the signal to noise is, is large. Um, so that, that this green curve here below, right? This is the anomaly. Um, it has this uh, predictable shape uh, that's, uh, and, and just to quickly describe what's going on here, we're having this isotopic fractionation um, uh, during the uptake um, that's adding this, uh, uh, creating this anomaly. And then we have, uh, even though CO2 is completely exchanged with um, this box model, uh, this surface, surface ocean box model, the, the isotopes have not completely exchanged. So we have another 10 years or, or more to completely exchange the isotopes. And so this is a, um, this may seem to be an exotic uh, measurement, an exotic parameter to some, um, although this has been around for quite some time. And these are, um, you know, uh, the, the, the mechanisms behind this and the fractionations that we expect are all um, well defined. And, uh, and furthermore, the measurements have come a long way. So uh, instead of taking one day to make one measurement, I was in Adam Subash's lab on Sunday, and we made uh, one measurement in 20 minutes. So um, with a precision of, you know, plus or minus 0.1, maybe 0.05. Um, that's pretty much the whole, that, that's the advertisement. That's the sales pitch, is that in addition to these um, uh, pretty standard observations we have now for quantifying um, changes in ocean carbon chemistry, we should be thinking about C13. And, um, and in fact, the signal is quite large, predictable, and uh, diagnostic, okay, of atmospheric CO2. There's no middling around here to get this lowering. It's the atmosphere doing it. Um, finally, what we're working on is, um, so con continuing to explore this utility. So we're thinking about durability and long-term impacts of OAE using a global uh, box model. Um, there's very interesting results for um, sort of Oh my gosh, um, C13 changes, efficacy of OAE with a California current system ROMs and detectability uh, with some other collaborators. Thank you. All right, so, so thank, thanks everyone for a really fantastic um, set of talks and lightning talks. All right, so the, so the format we're, we're going to work with here is a very open question and answer session with our panelists up here. Feel free to also ask questions targeted to our lightning talk speakers. They're mainly up in the front. We'll get a mic up to them. Um, and and the, really, the only guiding questions here are what we have up on the board, and, and that's to focus on uh, what, what are the uncertainties. So what are some of the quantifiable uncertainties, um, those um, that are, are the challenges to um, achieving um, meaningful MRV, what then are the uncertainties and processes that are maybe missing in our model and are difficult to quantify. And those are the two categories. If you're interested, just raise a hand and we'll get a, a mic over to you. Uh, Great set of talks. Thank you very much. That was, that was really interesting. So I want to dial it all the way back to the very beginning um, when there were those gating criteria uh, for these different technologies. And um, a question that kind of jumped out at me was, I think it was the first one focused on safety. Um, you want to make sure they're safe, that they're not causing harm to the ecosystem. But how do you prove the absence of harm? So how do you know that you're measuring the right thing, that you've measured long enough um, you know, fundamentally, you can't measure the absence of something. So conceptually, how is the industry approaching that? Um, I'm not an industry representative, but um, <laughs> I think it's a great question. I think, um, uh, you know, I've, I've been sort of thinking about um, the, way we're, the way we're sort of approaching this is kind of assembling a house of cards. Um, you know, we need to bring multiple lines of evidence to bear on any question that we're facing in this realm, whether it's quantification of efficacy or assessment of ecosystem impacts. And I think that we need to embrace kind of an adaptive stance. And um, we also need to acknowledge that 
the trajectory of you know CO2 emissions and the absence of action leads to significant harm. And so our baseline sort of criteria there is a relative one. Um, and and so I think um, in the context of uh, growth of the industry, you know, I think ecosystem impacts presents as a gating criteria, as was stated. Um, make an excellent point that we don't, you know, we to pin that down to to a high degree of certainty is problematic. Um, I think for technologies like ocean alkalinity enhancement or direct ocean removal, you know, it's a distinct um, space then for macroalgae cultivation because I think we can assert a priori that we're in net negative territory in the sense that the technology is very likely to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. It might remove less CO2 than we think, but it, um, or than we would like. Uh, but uh, in that sense, we can adopt a, and, and that, you know, our, our baseline empirical evidence suggests that the likelihood for significant deleterious ecosystem impacts is low. So, you know, that sort of space presents, um, I think, a, a, a condition where we can adopt a permissive stance on uncertainty early on with the, with the intention of, you know, ensuring that we have mechanisms in place. We sort of have a line of sight towards reducing that uncertainty over time. And that there's some iterative iterative processes where we're continuing to assess the ecosystem. So you know, I think having that kind of framework enshrined in policy or in, or in incentive frameworks that are enshrined in policy is going to be a really important thing. And and please do share your name when you when you speak up. Uh, Jessica Cross, Noah. My question is also about ecosystem impacts. Um, it seems like it's everybody's favorite problem to ignore right now, simply because we know so little about it. So my question for the panel uh, is what kind of data or what kind of data structures or products or builds is going to make it easier um, for you all to incorporate that kind of information into your models? Uh, such and, and you know, think about the products that we as a whole community could be generating, not necessarily just your friendly neighborhood government institutions. Uh, I mean, I don't know about. I think, uh, I'm not a modeler, so. Um, but I think for ecosystem impacts, um, we can only learn so much from laboratory experiments, for example. Um, and single single species experiments are great, um, but they're not going to tell us much about eco, uh, ecosystems. So I think uh, moving, I think to really understand ecosystem impacts, what we need to kind of focus on is moving towards small scale build experiments. Sorry, can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, but I think the most beneficial thing would be uh, mesocosm and small scale field experiments uh, would give us a better idea on really understanding ecosystem impacts. I could just add to that maybe a little bit for OIF, or I think actually it was pretty well documented that there was when the MISO scale experiments were done in the 90s and early 2000s, there was clearly you know, changes in the in the plankton community in response to OIF. But you know the question is, what's the long-term impact of those? And I, and getting back to the earlier question, I think also, can, at what point should you turn something off? And can you turn it off? And I would say, you know, that's something that you should evaluate in any of these technologies. I would argue for OIF, you know, in short term, you can turn it off pretty easily. Um, the longer term may be another question. But. Okay. Uh, hold on. I'm going to jump. Oh, sorry. I was going to jump in with a couple of the questions from online just to give those folks a chance. So there's two questions there right now. One from um, Brad Marston. This is asking if. Um, for iron fertilization uh, at scale, has the any albedo effects been investigated? And maybe to broaden that, have albedo effects been investigated for any of these um, CDR approaches? Um, as far as I'm aware, there's no been been no um, demonstrated albedo. I mean, the albedo effect comes from the production of dimethyl sulfide and. and sulfur compounds um, being produced 
through the some of the biogeochemical processes that result from OAS. And uh, um, I, I guess it's a bit theoretical. I think that's another thing that we need to measure, right? <laughs> Some of those sulfur compounds in that air sea gas exchange, whether that could actually have an impact, a positive impact in terms of an interesting question, another verification question. Um, yeah, I can jump in here. I think that might also relate to seaweed farming if you do that at large scales. Um, I've heard talk of potentially moving from just a carbon removal verification framework to a radiative forcing verification framework. Um, that seems to be much earlier stages, um, especially with respect to integration into industry standards. But I think that would be really important if it had a big impact on the albedo to also consider that in addition to whatever is happening with the carbon and ecosystems. Uh, all right, thanks. One more online question um, from um, Bob Anderson. This is to um, either Jing or Mallory, um, referring to the safety criterion. Um, what, what would be done with the amounts of um, acid generated alongside electrochemical alkalinity production? Yeah, I'm happy to pass this over to Mallory, who's actually working on doing this in real life, whereas I'm just modeling it. <laughs> Jump in for a second. So, um, there's a lot of different opportunities of where you can use. Please speak into the mic a little more okay. so they can hear. There's online. a lot of different opportunities on where you can use that acid. So in some cases, it's an industrial product that's low carbon efficiency. So if you're sited near a potential investor that wants to use that for descaling and desalination plants or something, you can use some of that. There's interesting aspects of can we use acid in um, well type sequestration of carbon on land, um, there may be options to kind of enhance the amount of carbon that you can store from other pathways. But a lot of that um, is kind of speculative at this point. But when we consider the broader industry perspectives, life cycle analyses, emissions, all these sorts of things, we do consider what happens with the acid from there. If you're interested in that topic, my email is Mallory at EbCarbon, and I can point you to the geochemists who are really interested in the acid story. Can I, can I go? Okay. Um, first, I'd like to thank everybody, all of the, huh? Oh, Ego John. Um, thanks to all of the speakers. Um, I learned a lot this afternoon, uh, this morning, and yesterday. Um, but um, I, I probably have some very dumb questions. Um, and I, I think people are nice here and tolerant, so I'm just going to have a go. Um, the question first, actually, um, you just answered it is the asset, because it sounds like you know the application is alkalinity to the ocean. So the asset produced, I mean, it sounds like you guys have a way to deal with it. Otherwise, there's acid, there's the base, and together, you know, the net effect would be zero. Um, but the second thing is, um, why do we have to apply it to the ocean? If our purpose is to sequester carbon and you just leave it, like if you already have sodium hydroxide, you leave it outside and it's, it's going to start to suck up CO2 from the atmosphere. So, I mean, I heard wonderful talks about modeling, you know, ecological effects, environmental impacts. Of course, you need to get a permit. But why bother doing this to begin with? Thank you. Okay, I'll go ahead and start. Um, yeah, so uh, a lot of it relates to, um, I guess, compared to more natural processes on land, like I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, competing land use constraints, um, the cost and emissions associated with uh, mining and dispersal of materials. There's a lot of considerations there for more engineered pro processes on land, like direct air capture. Um, there's costs and scalability challenges associated with those. So I think a lot of the draw to the oceans was people have this kind of romantic idea of like, oh, the ocean's already doing a lot of this in various ways and maybe we can enhance those. Um, and so that's where a lot of the draw has come from from my perspective, that there's maybe those advantages of enhancing a natural, um, naturally occurring process and that maybe that means it'll be cheaper or more scalable. But as we've heard today, there's lots of considerations about whether this is actually effective and also the scales at which people are talking about doing this in the oceans will undoubtedly have lots of negative effects for ocean life and other ocean systems. And so being able to communicate that as a community is going to be really important to maybe 
you know, put some realism in, into this, uh, this discussion and not necessarily, you know, maybe pour a little cold water on it to be like, hey, like, this is going to be part of a more comprehensive solution, hopefully, but there's challenges here as well, which I think you rightfully pointed out. <laughs> uh, Suzanne Craig, NASA Goddard. Um, I'm going to use this opportunity to ask a couple of quick questions. The first being, um, of all of these proposed uh, mechanisms for removing um, CO2, essentially, how do they compare in terms of magnitude to just not burning fossil fuels? Um. So we have to stop burning fossil fuels. And Agreed. <laughs> yeah. But currently, um, I think it's, there's a high likelihood that we've missed the 1.5 degree target. And so net removal is required even in an overshoot scenario. Um, and so there is no, you know, the, the transient climate response to emissions is predicated on cumulative emissions. It's approximately linear with respect to cumulative emissions. And so um, it is a requirement to, um, you know, given 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 the rate at which we are decarbonizing emissions, or you know, decarbonizing energy production, it is a requirement to to have active removal, to mean to meet those targets. And do the the mechanisms suggested or proposed here, um, perhaps in an additive fashion, would are they going to be sufficient to to do that? Do we know? I think that's the question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So the, the scale of this problem is very is really daunting, right? And I think the thing that one of the points I was trying to make in my talk is that that scale is daunting. Our task right now is not to conceive of achieving that scale, but rather to identify the rate limiting steps for setting the trajectory so that you know in 20 to 30 years we are on a path towards uh, a, a scaled EDR industry. Um, if I could just hog the, the microphone for a little longer. Um, Ken talked about quite an evocative um, scenario, iron fertilization. Um, a lot of you in here are certainly old enough to remember all of the, uh, the Russ George and the Haida, the way that the Haida people who are First Nations Indigenous Americans um, were essentially conned by this idea of iron fertilization. Um, so that was a highly unethical uh, use, unregulated, and un I think we all agree, highly unethical. Um, but from a more scientific, um, objective perspective, do we know in response to the, the Cullen and Boyd paper back in 2008, do we now have the, the modeling know-how or predictive know-how um, to estimate what might happen to the nitrous oxide and methane produced by those iron fertilization experiments and how that's going to factor into the net effect of carbon sequestration? No. Thank you. <laughs> I would agree with that. Hi, uh, Gwen Hennon, University of Alaska, Fairbanks. Um, I have a related thought, which is that um, there have been other um, geoengineering strategies that have had small scale tests that have greatly angered uh, Alaska Native communities. Um, thinking of the ICE 911, like glass beads spread over the Arctic thing. Um, and I want to ask the question of like, even with small scale testing of this, um, how do you obtain sufficient informed consent for people who are local to that area? Well, I could talk a little bit about iron fertilization. I mean, so the, Partly because of that Russ George experiment, there was a, an addition, what's called the London Protocol for ocean dumping, um, which basically, but it basically, I, it, it would consider iron fertilization and alkaline if you were going to dump a bunch of olivine or something in the ocean as well. Ocean dumping experiment, and you know, if you do that off, you know, 
certainly in iron fertilization, you're going to be doing out in the open ocean, right? Which would be out of any particular jurisdiction. But you're still going up against a, a legal norm. It's, I mean, you're not going to go to jail, but you're breaking the legal norms because it's, you haven't ratified that treaty anyway. But, um, but, you know, you're going against these legal norms. And so you, there are avenues for at least doing experimental work within those within those frameworks. And I didn't mention that as a part of the cost, but that cost alone, hiring, you know, the lawyers and the people that you would need to do all those regulatory um, evaluations will cost, you know, as much as the verification costs probably at least initially start. Add. Um, it's also just super important to engage with the local community as early as possible. Like, don't, you know, create your science plan um, and make all these big decisions and then go somewhere and tell people, oh, this is what we're going to do, and they feel like they have no say in it, but to, you know, engage as early as possible and to try to, like, make it collaborative. Don't feel like we are your saviors coming in. I'm going to jump in just with a quick plug for our working group, which is um, intentionally place-based, and so the the... The, it, we haven't rolled it all out yet, still in process, but um, when there are announcements to join working groups, they're intentionally re supposed to be regional nodes in order to engage broadly, including um, the kinds of communities that um, could be impacted and, and in, in like full, genuine um, ground, ground up inclusion. So we hope that that's part of that. Uh, Jessica Labronte, Texas a and Galveston. Uh, I was just wondering if any of your models include viruses because they can kind of be a wild card. They can help with the shuttle, like virus shuttle, or they could not help and Dave's worst case scenario could be a viral shunt which would bring the CO2 back. So any of your models are considering this? Um, so we didn't, but we had a lot of discussions about it as avenues for future work, not only viruses, but also extreme events like hurricanes and storms. Um, you know, anytime you're deploying a large biomass sink like that, you're going to need to contend with those factors. And there are tons of examples from agriculture where, you know, blights have wiped out uh, monocultural crops and, and things like that. So that's definitely next steps for uh, if we want to really be doing this at any scale to be able to account for those things. I add something too for that. Uh, outside of the uh, models, sorry. Uh, outside of models for our future mesocosm experiments, we're also looking at including uh, viruses in our analyses. Hello. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Um, hi, I'm Ming Yu. Um, I have a question for the panel in general. So we're do when we're doing all these um, CDR before the implement implementation process. Are we calculating the carbon emitted during extraction, transportation, or like the infant process of seaweed that it, uh, carbon emitted? And if I know there must be some life cycle assessment scientists who's doing this, but how closely are we collaborating with them? And um, is this a necessary calculation to do during supervising and monitoring? Thank you. Um, yeah, I can start off and then pass that along. Um, for my part of the work on the seaweed stuff that I presented, um, I was looking at a lot of data from life cycle assessments, and we didn't include the emissions associated with the materials manufacturing or like the physical goods, but we did include the emissions impact of transport. Um, and from my perspective right now, at least the types of studies that we're doing are, that's kind of the way it is using LCA data, um, but to a certain extent uh, within the bounds of the research goals of the the work that we're doing. Um, but I do think that it should be more collaborative if we want to really get a full system picture of, um, of what the, the total net emissions impact is. So we used LCA data for parts of it, but not for all of it. Um, and those bounds are important to also like spell out when you're talking about what the net carbon impact is. And I can just speak a little bit from my experience at Isometric so far, um, when we we're trying to quantify sort of how many tons of CO2 did you actually remove? We do definitely include all of the life cycle emissions from um, 
really the whole process of terminology in the LCA world is like cradle to grave, so including the emissions uh, created to, you know, get the material that you're using, um, the certain instruments that you might be using, transportation distances, electricity, energy usage. And you can imagine that there's a lot of uncertainties and difficulties with quantifying those as well. Um, but those are all uncertainties that sort of have to factor into your final net calculation of the net CO2 removed. Hi, uh, Julie Maurer from University of Rhode Island. Um, I have another question about the macroalgae um, cultivation. I was wondering if you guys are incorporating like seaweed diversity into this, um, if there's multiple different species that are being considered, or if this is potentially going to be a monoculture. It's kind of related to the vir virology question about marine disease outbreaks. Yeah, definitely. So um, the yield input to the economic modeling was based on what we called our like preferred species output. So the biophysical model um, did four different seaweed types that represent over 95% of the currently cultivated species. And we basically took whichever performed the best in each grid cell. So regionally, it does currently look more like a monoculture situation, but globally there is some diversity. I think that's definitely an avenue for future research to determine you know, if there is significant risk from, from pests or things that are related to that monocultural aspect within a smaller region. Um, we could look at, I could imagine, um, the, the kind of still the net carbon benefits of diversifying within those regions as well. Hi, um, David Hope from Seaworthy. I, I have a question. So if a country conducts, you know, one of these deployments and then the CDR happens in another country's EEC, who gets to claim the removal in their NDC? I feel like I'm talking a lot, so I'll keep this brief. But um, I, it's kind of a similar question in my mind to consumption-based accounting of emissions versus where the emissions are actually occurring um, in terms of where you draw the line there. Um, I don't have a good answer for you, but I think that that's just where my brain went in terms of uh, it, for CDR, where it's, you know, who's, who's doing the project of deployment versus where the CDR actually ends up. But that's a great question. I would love to discuss that more. I don't have an answer, but I can add a difficulty on top of it for OAE, for instance, um, where you have your CO2 uptake occurring over years. You can imagine that some of the uptake happens in one country, easy, and then it moves somewhere else, and a fraction of the uptake happens somewhere else. I think actually it'll be very, very difficult to really partition it into um, how much CO2 is removed where into that type of granularity. You could also imagine compete competition, so Project A and Project B co uh, have con destructive interference with each other or constructive interference. I might just add that's a really good argument for if you so suppose you started a company that was making profit off this, that actually their profit should just go and it should be a nonprofit company, right? It should just go into the global global money bank. Be redistributed for doing more research. Thank <laughs> Maybe a last comment. Uh, you know, we've heard a lot of reasons why we should be using our community, our knowledge to address CDR and what the impacts are. I think what we also heard is things can go wrong. And part of our knowledge stops things. We could actually, you know, I think we could have had a better response to the rogue geoengineers of Heidek Y if we could say in these conditions, in these places, this should never be done at this scale, this should never be done. So a lot of what we're doing is trying to put bounds on that with research. But lacking the research, they can say anything, they can probably do anything. That's a governance issue as well, but I think it's on us to provide the information to put bounds on where we want this field and where we want this technology to go. So that's on us, and I think we should all try and do that, whether in favor or not of deployment. We need the research now. Let's take one last question. I think we're getting to the end of our time. Okay, Sophie Chu, um, Captura. I, so there's this kind of inherent conflict between um, startups that need to get research done and do the pilot trials quickly and 
the pace of academic and government research. And um, I just want to, Matt, you had a, a phrase that said like good enough, right? So what is good enough for understanding what the impacts are to go ahead with the CDR research? Um, I think that question is uh, perhaps best answered by thinking not so much about the answer to the question, but how the answer to the question might be arrived at. Um, you know, I think uh, part of that is sort of a consensus, you know, con maybe consensus is the wrong word, but a community-driven process where, um, you know, the, the, ocean, the, the processes involved here um, span several orders of magnitude in spatial and temporal scales. They require uh, a diversity of, of disciplines um, to really, really tackle. Um, I've been thinking a lot about, um, you know, in the FRO, the Focus Research Organization model, some of our companion institutions are doing things like mapping brain circuitry. And, you know, mapping brain circuitry requires a lot of really smart neuroscientists. You know, mapping the connectivity of ocean ecosystems requires a lot of smart scientists from, you know, a lot of different disciplines. And it, it's just an inherently different, distinct, nuanced problem. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that we want to think about in the context of what we're trying to do is, at Seaworthy is provide sort of a fountainhead or a focal point to kind of galvanize, you know, some of the communication and some of the, um, some of the quantitative information upon which these kinds of assessments can be made and upon which informed conversations can be had. Um, you know, I think that there's criteria that we can establish, as I was mentioning earlier, about, you know, moving forward with technologies that on the basis of the, the collection of empirical evidence that we have at hand, we feel comfortable with, particularly in the sense that, they, that, they're, that they're very likely net negative and that, the, that a priori assessments of ecosystem risk present low criteria for concerns. In my view, uh, Ocean alkalinity enhancement and direct ocean removal fall into that category, and I think you know there again, like we need to instantiate sort of a line of sight on how we can improve uh, our assessments of uncertainty and how we can become more certain um, about ecological impacts. But in those two cases, I don't think that that should preclude moving forward with with you know early deployments and field trials um, because the urgency is is great. Thank you, everyone, for uh, contributing and participating in our panel discussion. I hope if you have more questions, feel free to seek out our panelists, our lightning talk speakers as well. Um, and yeah, thank you again.